Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, which will today be a hybrid stroke socially distanced meeting to be conducted remotely via WebEx and also physically here in the Council Chamber uh, today, Tuesday, 5th of October at 4 o'clock. And starting chair with the roll call, Alderman Bresland. Here, John. Alderman Devaney. Here, John. Alderman McClintock. Here, John. Alderman McCready. Alderman McCready. Here, John. Thank, thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Here, and Pearson. Councillor Donnelly. And Shaw. Councillor Doyle. Councillor Doyle. Councillor Duffy. Shaw. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Heaney. Shaw, John. Councillor McHugh. Councillor McHugh. Councillor Mooney. Here, John. And Councillor Riley. Here, John. Thank you, members. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Chief Executive, for the roll call. Uh, members, item three is the uh, is declarations of. Sorry, members, hold on. I'll just read the broadcast announcement. Um, I would like to remind everyone present at this meeting in the Guild Hall or in attendance remotely that this meeting it will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to be filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on when speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of this priv Council's privacy notice is available on the Council website, www.derrystraman.com. Members, the next item is the declarations of members' interests, which uh, would be appreciated if you can verbalise them if you're here in the room and if you're online, if you can in indicate in the chat box and it'll bring you in to record them publicly. I'm not seeing any members indicating any declarations of interest, so thank you for that. Um, Moving on to item four, which is the deputation to receive Mr. Steve Bradley into the West regarding real connectivity in the Northwest. Steve, I see you're joining us virtually. You're very welcome to today's meeting. So I'll hand over to you to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can everybody hear me OK? I, I can't see anything, so I'll assume that that's a yes. Yes, uh, Stephen, we, we can hear you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Chair, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present yourself and colleagues. And um, thanks also to Rachel Craig at the Council, who's been extremely helpful at uh, getting everything uh, up and running and on the ball for ourselves. Uh, just very briefly to explain why we asked to present to you all today. Um, you know, firstly, we're, we're very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about rail. We're very grateful for, for any such opportunity. Um, but there was a particular catalyst recently with the decision made out with the council to enable Clammill Housing Association to, uh, on appeal, uh, have planning permission to build on top of the former track bed uh, on Victoria Road on the city's water side. And that was a bit of a catalyst for us uh, to, uh, I guess, acknowledge a broader issue, which is that the, the council, on, on, in positive news, the council has two policies regarding rail expansion within the district, and and we know uh, it is keen to see that happen. But at the same time, there's a number of small, independent, isolated decisions being made within and by council, which aren't necessarily anything to do with rail, but which, when they aggregate up, uh, nonetheless have the potential to impact the future rail uh, expansion in our area. And the way we would characterize it is if you close, you know, lots of little doors before you find, but before you realize that you, you've, you find yourself with nowhere left to go in terms of trying to continue on either a metaphorical journey or, or to continue on real provision from our city. So that's why we're keen to uh, present and chat uh, to the governance and strategic planning committee today, uh, basically to implore that broader 
decision making and objectives within the council uh, factor in future potential for rail. And we've one or two suggestions for how we think uh, it would be great if that could be done. So hopefully that works as a preamble and as an introduction. Um, I believe one of your colleagues is going to uh, look after the slides for us, and we're very grateful for that. Um, if we could just flick on to the next one. Um, I didn't get the name of whoever's looking after the slides, so, but thank you for your help. Um, we'll start, first of all, just by giving you a very quick refresher. I'm, I'm sure you all know this, but I think it's helpful to, to start from the context of the current situation regarding rail uh, within uh, Northern Ireland, the islands, and uh, our, our city district as well. So next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're mostly are all familiar with this. We have 54 railway stations in Northern Ireland, of which only three are east of, are west of the River Ban. Uh, of those, you have Bellarina, which is a population of 330 people, and you have Castle Rock, which has got a population of just over 2,000. So in reality, there's only one decent sized conurbation west of the Ban that has rail, and that, that's our own city. And you can see the provision on the other side uh, of Northern Ireland in, in the three eastern counties, and particular in the greater Belfast area is, is extremely uh, dense provision and extremely rich in terms of the real access they have there versus what we have in, in our patch. Next slide, please. And this is how that translates up on an all island basis. Uh, this map does the rounds regularly on social media and again, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but you know, it, it, it should never fail to shock people. The massive gap that exists both in the northwest of the islands, in the west of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, and in the border region. There, there's clearly, it's like somebody took a set of scissors and cut out rail in a very important corner of the island. And, and part of what we look to do is, is to, within our own area, is, is to uh, lobby to see that situation change. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the, that's the that's what we have in terms of the real network. Uh, and the gaps exi that exist within that, but even within the current real provision we have, so even taking what we do have, those three stations west of the ban, the railway line between Derry and Belfast, there's still a very clear east-west dis disparity in provision, and we've, but we've uh, sort of uh, presented them together in what we call the six to fix, which we've been talking about now for a couple of years. One of them has been fixed, which we're very grateful for. And a couple of the city's MLAs were helpful in that. So we're very grateful for their help. Um, it was the issue of being able to buy a ticket online or at the station in Derry, which would get you all the way to Dublin without having to buy two separate tickets and having to pay extra for that. It used to be that every station from Coleraine eastwards could do that, and we couldn't on our side of the river ban. That's uh, fortunately been fixed as of spring last year. So we're grateful for that. However, we still have the situation whereby Northern Ireland's second biggest city has only one train that gets people into Belfast before 9 a.m. in the morning. So whether they're studying or whether they're working, there's only one train that 12 minutes past six that will get you in in time. Coleraine has four such trains. And even Port Rush, which is a seaside village, if we're honest, has two options. And then if you look at peak hours, which is number two on here, uh, between 4 and 6 p.m., there's a half hourly train service from Belfast that runs all the way to Coleraine and then stops there. Um, so we only have an hourly service during peak hours, whereas every station in, from Coleraine eastwards has a half hourly service in peak times. Number three has been fixed. Number four, if you want to go to a, a concert or the theatre or an evening out with friends or, or colleagues in Belfast, you have to leave before nine o'clock because the, the last train that will get you to Derry on a Saturday evening is at ten past nine. So you're going to have to like leave your dinner table or or you know, get out of the gig, you know, anytime after half past eight, which just means that rail isn't a viable option to socialise in Belfast and then come back out towards Derry. Whereas if you lived in Coleraine, the last train that we get you from Belfast to home is at twenty to eleven at night, which is plenty of time for a gig, for the theatre, or for dinner. Uh, Sundays is a real particular bugbear. The the Derry only had a, a, a service to Belfast once every two hours up until 2017. That was changed, but for some reason, the decision was made to only change it Monday to Saturday. We were told demand wouldn't be there to change it on Sunday, but we were also told demand wouldn't be there to change it to a, an early service in the first place. Um, so as a result, there are only six trains on a Sunday between Derry, and, uh, between Derry and Belfast. That's one every two hours. So if you miss one, you're snookered. You have to wait pretty much two hours for the next. Whereas every other station from Coleraine and eastwards 
as a train every hour as they do the rest of the week. And that's 13 services in total. And uh, the, the last one there, number six, is, is the frequency issue, which I mentioned. And we think that in particular, there's no rationale to have a different quality of service on a Sunday because people still need to go to, 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 to visit people, still need to go to university in Coleraine or Derry or Belfast on a Sunday. They still need to catch flights. They still need to do all sorts of things on a Sunday. Um, so that gives you a flavor of even within the network we currently have, Derry is very much the second class relation in terms of real provision. So next slide, please. So just a very quick reminder of, you know, why, why do we talk about real? Because it's not just about transport. It's not just about getting people from A to B. There are seven broader benefits, which we would summarize briefly as the following economically. But we know this is common sense and we see it happen everywhere. Jobs and people will gravitate towards places that have good infrastructure ahead of those which have poor infrastructure. And that's, I guess, it's so pretty obvious it doesn't need to be said because you just see it happen in action. But we need to remind ourselves that we have poor infrastructure in our city and therefore we shouldn't be surprised that our population is at best stagnating and that we have the highest unemployment in Northern Ireland. Um, employment issues is also not just about uh, being able to, you know, uh, where work is cited, but also people living within our district being able to access job opportunities elsewhere right, with the district and also training opportunities. There's research which shows that if you start in a disadvantaged area and improve its public transport connections, you effectively drive down the unemployment rate and drive up the skills rate because people who previously, uh, and bear in mind a lot of people won't have access to a vehicle in disadvantaged areas, people who previously couldn't make a journey to fulfill a job because it was too long, it took too many changes, it was too expensive, all of a sudden transport's improved so they can access greater job opportunities and training opportunities too. And that touches on the third point here, which is social justice, which I'll come on to in slightly more detail in a second. It's easy to think that most people in our area drive and, and most do, but over a third of people within Derry do not have access to a vehicle and the figure for Straban is 30% and it's even worse than some of the other smaller towns in our district, which I'll show you in a second. But, you know, we need to make sure that decisions we're making as a district help and enable those people who don't have access to a vehicle and that we're not always thinking solely or primarily about those people who do have access to a vehicle. Uh, tourism, it's obvious a lot of people who visit you know, this island, whether they fly into Dublin or Belfast or wherever, will not want to drive, will not be able to drive, but will want to get around and see things. And without good quality public transport, it makes it less likely and harder for, for us to maximise the number of people who will visit our area. Status, you know, there's just certain things you expect to see in a regional capital. There's certain things you expect to see in a city of any scale or gravitas. I would put a, a decent university in that category, but also decent infrastructure and a particular rail. It's something that people just expect to see. Uh, climate change and the climate crisis, you know, we know about this. The council itself has declared uh, the climate emergency and has policies to do something about it. You know, we need if we want people to drive less, rather than just berate them, we need to give them viable alternatives whereby it's easy, it's cost effective, and it's, uh, it's, it's expedient to use options other than driving. So they don't feel that they always have to drive where they can to do any journey. And finally, quality of life, you know, by, by getting people out of vehicles, whether they're electric vehicles or, 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 or combustion engines, you know, we'll have cleaner air, we'll have less congestion and just easier journeys. It's much easier to commute by rail or by bus than it is by driving. So that's the seven key benefits of real because really keen for you guys to think real is not just about getting from A to B. It's about a whole broader package of, uh, you know, uh, societal benefits. Next slide, please. So I mentioned very briefly low car ownership, and this is really interesting. The first thing is I, I've probably mislabeled this, this graph. This is sense, this is information from the last census. So it'll be interesting to see next year how and if these numbers have changed. But these aren't just the stats for car ownership. These are the statistics for uh, access to a vehicle. So these are the percentages of people uh, in, in, the, in the five areas of Northern Ireland where car access is the lowest. And that means not just that they don't own a car or a vehicle themselves, 
but they don't have access to one through family, through friends, or through neighbours. So these are people who really, you know, the public transport is their only option. Public transport, bicycle, and foot is their only option to get around. So these are five places that have the highest percentage of households who don't have access to a car or van. Uh, Fintana, I, I have no idea how anybody can survive in Fintana. Over four out of every ten people there do not have access to a vehicle. You'd expect to see Belfast featuring highly here because it's a large metropolis and it has by far the best infrastructure in Northern Ireland. You can happily live in Belfast and get around quite easily, access jobs, training, social life uh, through their public transport network. But it's number three, four, and five that are very interesting because they're all within our district. And again, you'd probably expect Derry to have a relatively low level of car ownership because it's a city. But again, factor in what we have poor infrastructure. So how does somebody, you know, living in outlying areas, whether it be uh, you know Tam or or uh, Godna Scale or Gallia, how do they get around? How do they access opportunities if they don't have a vehicle? But what's very interesting is Newton Stewart and Donamana, which are both areas that had rail up until 1965. So I'm sure some some of the people listening to this presentation may remember the days when Newton Stewart and Donamana had rail. You may even have travelled on it. Um, those areas, over one in every three people do not have access to a vehicle. And we know that in rural areas of Northern Ireland, public transport is pretty poor. So again, you know, there are significant numbers of people throughout our district who do not have access to a vehicle, which makes them really heavily reliant on public transport. But the infrastructure and the provision of that is very poor within our district. Uh, next slide, please. And this just follows on from that. There are 10 towns in Northern Ireland within the medium sized category. That means they have a population of between 10,000 and 18,000. And the, of those, the, the town which has the uh, highest percentage of households without access to a car or vehicle is Straban. And it's quite a bit higher from the next one. So it's a 30, 31%. And you'll note again, Dungannon is in there, which is not too far from us. And the Mavadi, which, although in a separate council area, is definitely within the orbit of Derry City. Uh, what's interesting is the three at the bottom, uh, which are three the three towns, the three medium-sized towns which have the lowest percentage of households without access to a caravan. They also either have rail provision, or they have it just up the road within five miles. So not only not only do more people have a vehicle there, they also have the alternatives that we don't have in our district. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of a, you've probably seen some of this. So some of you have probably seen this. This is from the Republic, the CSO, based on the 2016 census. And it's about people traveling from the Republic into Northern Ireland for either work or study on a daily basis. Uh, there's a lot going on in this map, but what you need to focus on is the color red and the color green in Inishowen, Derry City, and the Lagan Valley area of Donegal alongside Japan. What this basically shows us is despite the vast majority of the population on the island being on the Belfast to Dublin corridor, and it would be intuitive to think, surely most people who are crossing the border every day are in that area, because that area has a combined population of over 2 million. In reality, uh, almost half of all cross-border commuting from the Republic into Northern Ireland every day is from Donegal to Derry City, or from Donegal into Strabane. Uh, and that means uh, the other figures there are nearly all cross border commuting that comes from County Donegal is coming into Derry. A very small amount is going to Fermanagh, but most of it is coming into Derry. And the key issue here is these are journeys people are making every day, so they need to make them. But none of those journeys are enabled by rail because Donegal has no rail infrastructure. Where there is no rail connection from Letterkenny to Derry. And I do wonder if there was, if there was rail provision in Letterkenny, Newton Cunningham coming into Derry, if Strabane was on the rail map, how different that heat map would look in terms of people making that journey by vehicle, driving into our city, clogging up our roads, affecting our air quality, uh, versus if they're able to use public transport. Because at the moment, let's be honest, those people are almost entirely going to be driving. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is what Into the West is specifically campaigning for. We're looking for uh, three reopened rail lines in counties uh, Derry, Lutton, Derry, Tyrone, Fermanagh, and Donegal. Uh, the one in red is basically the route that would connect the northwest through to Dublin. 
So it would be from Letterkenny to Derry, down to Portadown on the Dublin. The route in green is then connecting Oma up to Sligo and the Western Quarter via Enniskillen. And then the yellow one is connecting uh, you know, Derry and Letterkenny, again, down to the Western Rail Quarter uh, via Sligo. So that's what we're campaigning for as an organization, which we think would really start to change and address some of the issues we mentioned previously. Next slide, please. And then if, if those things we're asking for were to happen, this is how that real map of Ireland would look in the future. And I think bar maybe one line covering Navin through Monaghan, you'd be pretty much there in terms of decent real provision across the island and across the Northwest. So if we can get the asks we're requesting from the authorities delivered, I think you know we're, we'll be getting towards a status of kind of job done for decent real infrastructure in Northern Ireland and across the island. Next slide, please. So that was a whistle stop uh, run through the context. I think that's just helpful to kind of refresh everybody in terms of where we are. So the problem as we see it, if we pop onto the next slide, is it's great that the council has two different policies that it's adopted in the last number of years about supporting real expansion, but without any clear overview of where or how the future real expansion could happen within the district, what, we, what we're gonna find and what is already starting to happen is lots of small independent decisions are being made which individually risk closing doors on the physical possibility of extending real within our district. So we can pop onto the next slide, please. Um, just gonna leave this here for a second and then I'll come back to this shortly in the presentation, but number one on there, the red dot is Waterside Railway Station. Uh, that the new the, the the restored transport hub number two is the proposed clam mill building just slightly south of that south of Craig Avenue Bridge number three is Brehen Boathouse and number four is the Foyle Valley Railway Centre which is now uh, looked after by the excellent Destin Charity so I'm going to pop on from that but we'll come back to that in a minute uh, next slide please so if we start if we think about that red dot I think the driving principle here is that Assuming we get expanded real provision from our city, assuming we don't always and forever remain a real terminus with only one stop on the water side and nothing after that, then it makes absolute sense to ensure that any future real provision occurs out of a single unified, you know, Derry London Derry Central Station. You know, originally our city had four different railway lines and four different starting points, one on Duke Street, which we still have. Victoria Road, Foyle Road and Pennyburn. And that reflected how 150 years ago the real network was put together. It was basically competing private companies who would put in a line towards certain places and it just existed in splendid isolation and competition from each other. But that's not how we do things nowadays in terms of rail. Uh, Belfast up until the 90s was very similar. Some of you may remember up, up until the 90s, if you got the train from Derry to Belfast, you had to go down to Lisburn and back up again because there was no direct connection between all of them and they addressed that because the reality is in the modern world you know we, we will need all real services from our city to leave from a single centralized station we're a small city we, we shouldn't have disconnected stations which are independent terminuses on their own people will not the days it might have happened in victorian times but people now will not walk from the end of the line in one station to the start of the line in another station in a different part of our city, even if it's only a five or 10 minute walk or a bus journey, that's just not how people want to travel anymore. It's not how people want to do it with baggage in the rain, that sort of thing. We need a fully integrated railway system with a single unified station from our city and hopefully other stations branching out from that in and around our city, but we need all roads must lead to one point in our city. Um, and there's other reasons there to, to, to explain that, but hopefully everybody agrees that that is a sensible principle to adopt. And then if we accept that principle, we pop onto the next slide. Then I'm sort of gonna walk you through some pretty obvious things here, but that's Donegal in the yellow, the city side of Derry, which it surrounds, the red dot for where Waterside Railway Station is currently, and the blue line is the River Foyle. If we're gonna have, connectivity from the Waterside Station to Donegal, 
at some point, it is a geographical fact that the rail line is going to have to cross the river foil. There is no other way around this. At some point, it is going to have to cross the river. So we pop on the next slide. We start to look at what the problems with that are. Uh, what is that railway station is very close to Craig Avon Bridge. There's railway railways don't like sharp edges. They don't like sharp angles. They tend to have very gentle curves. And that's to do with the speed and the fact that it's a fixed route and everything else. Uh, railways do not do 90 degree turns. So, for example, back in the day, the lower deck of Craig Avon Bridge used to carry uh, rail carriages. They were freight rail carriages and there was turning tables at either end or cer sorry, certainly at the uh, city side end to enable them to turn that 90 degree angle. But for modern trains, it will be physically impossible to have them use the bottom deck of Craig Avon Bridge. Because the angle, particularly on the city side by full road, is just far too sharp. So if we want to get uh, real, if we want to get our trains to cross the River Foil north of Craig Avon Bridge, there simply isn't the room, as shown by those two blue angles. Therefore, we can't get them to cross north of Craig Avon Bridge. Uh, next slide, please. So if that is going to happen, they have to do it somewhere south of Craig Avon Bridge, and there's lots of options for that. And one possibility could be if we do have a third road bridge uh, to the south of our city, which has been discussed uh, lots of times before, and has been suggested it could happen either at Perhen or new buildings. That could be a perfect place to enable rail to cross over the River Foyle and continue on to uh, to Donegal, and it could even potentially go into Donegal and back into Tyrone. There's lots of options, but again, the point is, got to cross the river somewhere. Can't do it north of Craig Avon Bridge. So it has to be somewhere after Craig Adam Bridge to the south. And then the next slide shows us where the clam mill building is a killer. Because if we have to cross the foil somewhere south of Craig Adam Bridge, and if we're going to have a single unified station out of the water side, then the trains need to continue down right through the land that clam mill now have permission to build uh, a block of flats on. And if they build that block of flats, the question then is, how are we going to get a connected railway station, a single central railway station, and how are we going to get trains to cross River Foil, to go into Donegal, potentially to go back into Tyrone again from there, or even if they're just running south on the, the, the Northern Ireland side of, of the river, all the way down to Straban and on through Tyrone, how can they do that from a single multi-connected station when there's a block of flats being built in the way. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and it's not just potentially the Clam Mill building, which is shown as number two on here. The council is looking for uh, uh, options for what to do with regards number three, which is Brehan Boathouse. Again, it could be in the future that rail needs to go travel either through that site or very close to that site. It used to travel uh, across what is effectively the car park area of Brehan Boathouse. But if the council makes decisions on Bahen Boathouse uh, in isolation of the fact that rail could in the future have to go through there again, then we could find that yet another way of extending rail from our city is closed. And again, we're tightening the, the screw whereby we have even less chance of getting rail over the river and south of our city. And the same with number four. I'm, I'm a very big fan of Destin. I think they do tremendous work. Uh, the council has assigned uh, the old Foy Valley Railway Centre to Destin on, on, a, on a lease of a certain length. Uh, but again, you know, it may be that, that the rail needs to or somehow could cross over either to where Foy Valley, Valley Railway Museum is or to the land south of that. And again, if new structures get put there or new activities happen there, we could be closing yet another door on the future rail expansion in the city. And that's the broader point we really wanted to make here today is there are currently, and no doubt in future, there will be other small decisions being made in isolation, but nobody is considering any impact upon rail because you know it, there's no obvious impact in rail. But we could find that they all add up to us being hemmed in as a city, whereby we cannot get trains south of that number one red dot on there. So we either completely stop rail expansion from our city, and we just accept that we're going to be forever a real terminus and the rest of the island will just have better infrastructure and ignore us. 
or we end up having disjointed railway stations where we have to bus people between them or they have to walk in the rain with their bags and everything else. And that's just not the way the modern world works. People won't do that. People won't get a train from Derry, or sorry, from Letterkenny to Derry, get out, walk to another station, wait for another train, get on there. They'll just drive. Um, and again, a lot of those people won't have the option to drive because they don't have access to a vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, this is an ideal world. This is kind of what into the West would see is what, what you know, uh, what, what we could have in our area if everything went well. And that would be a network that stretches from, you know, from Derry, it snakes out in three directions, going uh, west into Donegal, uh, covering Letterkenny, Newton Cunningham. Uh, as part of that, you could have a, a new city side station somewhere along Letterkenny Road. You could also head in south to Tyrone. You could bring rail back to places like new buildings. Uh, you know, you could look at Simon Mills, Victoria Bridge, Newton Stewart. Again, all areas within the council, uh, again, with relatively some of them with very, very low car access, uh, connecting us all the way down to Oma and from there on to, to Portadown in Dublin. And also, we're, we're also pushing for Limavadic to be more directly connected into the real network as well, because whilst it's not in our council area, it's certainly within the orbit of the Northwest City region. And it's a large population centre that currently is near to rail, but doesn't have it running through. Um, so this is what we would have in an ideal world, but again, if we can't get the trains to physically go south of Waterside Railway Station, we can't deliver the two bottom blue lines on here because we can't get them over to Donegal and we can't get them down the uh, northern side of the river bank towards Tyrone. Uh, next slide, please. So that's a whistle stop tour through the context and through the very specific issue as we see it of independent disjointed decisions being made, which make perfect sense in isolation, but which combined could really uh, deal a killer blow to rate expansion, not just for our city, it should be pointed out. Bear in mind, Derry has by far the biggest population of any uh, urban settlement in the west of Northern Ireland. So if you're looking to restore rail to Tyrone and you can't have a direct connection into Derry, you know, the old routes that ran from Derry down to Port of Down, they used to go through Straban, uh, Victoria Bridge, Sion Mills, Oma, Dungan, and all those places. If you add up the population of every single stop between new buildings and Port of Down, it is smaller than the population of Derry City on its own. So to cut a long story short, if you can't include Derry as part of that real line, that reopen real line, you effectively destroy the economic viability and the business case for it, because the populations are unlikely to be big enough to warrant it. So you effectively kill out any chance of Straban, Sia Mills, Victoria Bridge, Oma Dungannon getting real back. If they don't get real back, Fermanagh is not going to get it back because the most obvious and, and, and most densely populated route to bring real back to Fermanagh is from Oma to Enniskillen and then potentially down the line on to Sligo. And again, if you can't get real from Derry to Letterkenny, you're not going to get real back to Donegal because Letterkenny has by far the biggest population in Donegal. It is a bigger population than all the other potential routes along there. Uh, you know, you have Ballad Buffet, Bondoran, Ballyshan, and Donegal Town. So if we can't connect Derry and Letterkenny, I just can't see how bringing rail back to Donegal becomes viable at all. So it's not just about uh, being a, a killer blow for rail expansion out of Derry. It's also the entire west of Northern Ireland and County Donegal as well. So our last slide, uh, please, is our ask. And I appreciate you guys may not be in a position to commit to some of these things, but the committee is certainly in a position to make recommendations to the rest of the council. Firstly, um, we'd be very keen and very anxious to see the council play a much more proactive role in campaigning for real expansion. We would contrast how Derry Stavan Council is, is approaching this with how the ABC Council is with regards to Portadown Armagh reopening. Portadown Armagh reopening is about the same distance as Derry Straban, but a significantly smaller population. Uh, there's a really fantastic campaign group who have been pushing on that, and we want Portadown Armagh to open, we want rail to as many other places in Northern Ireland as we can. But the ABC Council has put some of its own money into a feasibility study, and it's got the DFI on board to fund the rest of it. So it is already ahead of us in making the case for reopening the rail line between Portadown and Armagh, so if a sum of money appeared tomorrow, but let's say for the sake of it, either through the union connectivity review 
or the All Island money or, or whatever things, um, you would find somewhere like Porto and Armagh is ahead of the game versus us in saying, well, we'd like real between Derry and Stavan or between Derry and, Letter and Letterkenny. Um, so that the first thing is, you know, I, we see other councils who are really gung ho about this and are fighting the battle, whereas our council has passed policies, which are very welcome. We'd be very keen for the council to be much more hungry uh, for real expansion uh, and, and much more uh, proactive on it. Uh, secondly, we're concerned at the lack of an ambitious rule for real in some key council strategies. And in the recently published Northwest Transport Strategy, uh, was pretty much dealing with the real network as we currently have. Uh, you know, it really should have been much more ambitious in our view about to look at real expansion. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to see the council grab this issue by the scruff of the neck, not just leave it largely or entirely to a community led organization like ourselves. We really want the council to vigorously champion the case of expanded real in our area because it's the right thing to do for our city and our district. And secondly, we, a, a proposal we'd like to make, uh, we think it would be helpful if there was a real working group established within the council as part of that whole process. And it would be a combination of uh, elected members, but also bring in, you know, experts from outside, you know, uh, people from, you know, with civil engineering expertise, uh, transport expertise, that sort of thing. And effectively, that group would look at the nuts and bolts of if we're going to extend real from our city into the rest of the district and into other counties, where are the options to do that? And what are the implications of that on any future decisions the council could or should be making? And then having reached those conclusions, then ensure that the key stakeholders from DFI and TransLink through to the council itself, particularly the planning department, um, are aware of what those options are and that they are factored in to future decision making. So as that map with the little, you know, the number two, three, and four, and there may be other little blue dots in the future, but we're not closing small individual doors which aggregate up to effectively kill off real expansion either from our city or across the entire west of Northern Ireland. So that, that's our, our two asks. Uh, that's our last slide. There's one more, which basically is a thank you. Um, there we go. Fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, very keen to hear any questions or challenges or points you have to make on all of that. I did see, I think, Councillor Edwards uh, so on the chat uh, certainly has got one. But again, thank you for listening. Thanks for giving us the time. Thanks to the chair for giving us that opportunity. And thanks again to Rachel Craig for all our help with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Steve, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks to Leslie Ann and AT for moving us through the slides. Um, but appreciate the time that went into putting that together for us, Steve, in relation to not just uh, the comprehensiveness of the uh, presentation, but the fact that we got it in advance uh, before today so that elected members could have a read through it and, uh, and give it some thought. Uh, as you've indicated, there is some in, uh, indicated speakers in the chat box which they'll bring in. Uh, but before I do, I just want to also uh, pay tribute to Into the West for all the work they've done, not just uh, in recent years, but for many decades in terms of campaigning for real in the Northwest, trying to uh, encourage investment uh, by government into uh, this service uh, in our city and, and district. And, and I agree with the point you're making in relation to how important it is for the entire Northwest that our city is the hub for that. Because as someone who's originally from Fermanagh and has family who remember having trains in that part of the world, uh, we obviously have a council area now that includes Straban. And again, uh, there were people there who were very keen uh, to hear uh, about the real possibilities and, and real expansion into that county as well. So it is important that in this council area uh, that we are seen to be uh, leading the way in relation to delivering real expansion, not just for our own city and district, but the wider northwest of the island as a whole. Um, happy enough to open it up to the floor. There are a number of indicated speakers in the chat box, uh, which I'll come to. So I'll take them in the order of seeing them. So uh, first is um, Councillor Stephen Edwards then Alderman Hilary McClintock, and then Councillor Sean Harkin, and then uh, Councillor Connor Haney. Thank you. Stephen. Yep, Chair, thanks for letting me in. I'm not a member of this committee, so uh, thanks for letting me in. I just first want to thank uh, Steve, and I want to commend him, uh, Jim Eamon, and all the others within Into the West for their continuing uh, and effective lobbying. Um, I think that needs to be said first. And, and your first slide shows, Steve, there that real divide is shocking across the North. 
uh, with lots of the northwest and the west's province uh, being left out. Um, and I'll leave the scheduling issues uh, to my colleagues in, uh, in Derry, um, between the Derry and the Belfast line. Uh, but my real interest, Steve, as you, as you probably know, is uh, getting the, the Great Northern Railway line uh, reinstated, um, especially from Derry um, to Straban and further on to um, Dungannon. And as your stats have shown there in your slides, Steve, there are many people who don't uh, drive a car or go to have access their, their car across or district, and I know especially case of my own uh, there, DA, and you refer to Newton Stewart in particular there, um, and it is start to look at the difference between our towns and villages in the 1950s and 1960s when rail was such a major part of society. Um, and as you know, I brought a, a motion to council um, calling for the Great Northern Railway line to be um, reopened again, and I was actually shocked about the public support for it, um, which uh, took, took me by surprise. There's so much support out there for it. Um, and given this, I do think we need to um, work on reopening uh, the railways. And I've lobbied consecutive infrastructure ministers over the years, and I've met way into the West, and I hope that things uh, could finally uh, progress. Uh, and recently, I have welcomed the Dow Island Strategic Rail Review, um, launched by Minister Mahon and Minister Ryan. I think it's a step in the right direction. So. My, my first sort of question there, Steve, would be, um, uh, do you think this real real review will help uh, identify opportunities in the Northwest and the West as province, and, and especially expanding rail to Straban, St. Mosnick, Stuart, Oma, um, as you outlined there? Um, and do you also think there's a, a massive need to have a, our own feasibility study um, done with Council? Um, I know you referenced it there, um, the Dharma City, Banbridge and Craig Am Council, they're currently looking at feasibility along with DFA as something I'd be very uh, keen to, to pursue. Um, another area, Steve, is um, with the real uh, reopening in Scotland um, in rural areas, um, which I believe have got less of a population than Strabane and Oban, uh, for example. Do you think there's any lessons that can be learned uh, from Scotland on this um, and how we could use those lessons uh, locally for our own purposes? Um, especially when you look at, as you've raised there rightly, uh, the Clamwell Flats and, and other developments which would impede real development uh, here. On a final note, I, I do like the idea of the real working group. It'd be something I would uh, definitely like to get involved in. I'm not um, a member of this committee, so I can't propose that, but it's something that hopefully I would like to, to see happen in this council because it's something I'm definitely very passionate about is, is the real ways. But, that's my comments, uh, Steve. So again, thank you for coming in and, and giving the presentation. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Edwards. I'll bring in a number of the other speakers, Steve, and then I'll take a break after four speakers and you can come back. So next we have Alderman Heron McClintock. Chair, I think maybe I would need to declare an interest as a member of the planning committee. I'm not sure, but it might be as well for me to do that anyway. Um, and can I thank Steve for his presentation? The clarity of it was very striking and made it very simple for us to understand. Absolutely get what you're saying, Steve. The whole knock on effects on people, knock on effects on the environment. It's not just a question of having a railway just to go from one place to another. Uh, it's really it's all the other issues that are affected by this. And it's very, very clear that there is a real disparity between east of the province and west of the province. Um, and I do absolutely get the whole idea, the whole thing that you're saying about individual uh, decisions do affect the overall um, viability of uh, the, the progression of the rail network in the, in the years to come. And I think I absolutely agree with you. We need a single hub within the city and the other spokes coming off from that. Absolutely get what you're saying there as well. Um, and I suppose my thinking, when. Uh, I put my name in the chat box there, was very much like uh, Councillor Edwards before me, was to ask about whether we need to be doing a feasibility study and to find out from you just about how your interactions, which I presume you've had with um, 
uh, Stormont Ministers, um, Department of Environment and any others, just what sort of a reaction you're getting from them. Although this is obviously something that's going to have to be driven locally and probably the way forward is going to be a working group um, to move this forward. So it's really just to see what your engagement with Stormont is. Obviously, there's going to be big money involved here. We're going to need all the stakeholders. It's more than just council, but really interested to find out your uh, thinking on the whole feasibility aspect locally. And thank you again for the presentation. Okay, thanks for that, Henry. Uh, next in the Kennedy speaker is Councillor Sean Harkin. Sean. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm not a member of this group, uh, so or this committee. Uh, so thank you, Chair, for letting me in, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to stay uh, for much longer. Um, but first of all, I want to thank Stephen and the West for uh, making time to come and discuss this with us today, because it's such an important issue. And I agree. I think uh, Steve's presentation was one of the best and clearest that we've had. And um, the, the charts really helped to demonstrate. Uh, if we needed any more demonstration, how inadequate our rail services are in Derry and the Northwest, um, and all the benefits that will come with um, vastly expanding and developing our, our rail network. Uh, I just want to say something first about Into the West. Look, uh, in, Into the West have been lobbying in this issue, uh, and I'm glad now that Into the West is being heard uh, by more organisations and, and here in the Council. And has actually been taken seriously uh, for a long time. I don't believe uh, the end of the West has been given the kind of uh, has been taken uh, seriously on, on their primary focus of uh, defending our rail services, trying to expand them. And indeed, if end of the West had been active with uh, workers uh, on the rails, um, we would have absolutely no rail services at all to even build upon uh, from out of Derry right now. And I think that this represents, uh, you know, one, it's about the neglect of the Northwest uh, from our executive over many, many decades. Um, but also they have not built upon it, uh, you know, uh, e even in recent years, uh, I think means that there, there's a lot of lip service, I still believe, to the issue of rail. Uh, and I'll come to that right now. Um, I mean, look. Even what Steve went through there in terms of like our services are a disgrace. It's shocking. It's shocking when you look at like, you know, not even the fact not this is not about the upgrade not being finished now and that's pushed back for until 2027. It could be longer, right? Uh, even the basic services that we have in terms of the number of trains, uh, people's access at the weekend, when the trains arrive and, and, and get to Belfast, it, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I, I really don't understand why this hasn't been addressed in Stormont. I mean, it's really frustrating uh, where it's like it's on a map. You can look at it. It's so clear. It's such uh, I mean, it's uh, it's because we're in the northwest. It's just it's so anyway, I don't want to just rant about the frustrations, but like that this is what when people look to use the rail, this is what people have to engage with. Um, and, and, and that's why it leaves people so frustrated. Um, on the positive side, there's a lot of discussion uh, about uh, the need to expand rail in the Northwest and across Ireland. And, and I think the end of the West has engaged in every possible discussion platform that has been made available, whether it's been on a, uh, through the British government, through the, to the Irish government, uh, proposals here to council, engagements with uh, the executive. Uh, and I think that they're getting positive feedback. But I do think that the fact that Steve is here today means that there's still an outsized role that into the West is being forced to play because this work is still not being carried by uh, the council. It's not being carried yet by the uh, uh, by TransLink. It's not yet being carried by the executive because ultimately, if it's, if it's accepted that we need to develop our rail network for all the reasons that uh, Steve went over and I'll not repeat them, it, it has to then become uh, the work of this council and and, and every and, and, and others that agree. So I think we need to push harder at Stormont. And I do agree with Steve that the council has to take on responsibility uh, that, that then into the West can feed into. Uh, but it shouldn't be into the West constantly coming to the door of the council to knock and say, you know, have you what about doing this? What about going to this committee and making this proposal? I think it has to be the actual council. 
So I, I again, I'm not on the committee, but I, I 100% uh, agree with Steve's proposal that we should set up a specific real working group um, that that is monitoring our progress, because the reality is, while there is positive discussions about rail, there's not a single new track being laid anytime soon in Derry in the Northwest, and that's the problem. And I think that look, whether it's McGee, whether it's it's rail. Uh, people will believe it when they see it. And right now, there's no new tracks going down. And in fact, what we're getting is uh, plans that were made about basic rail upgrades are being pushed back into whenever they happen. Um, so thanks, Steve, for coming along and, and, and excellent presentation. And I think, it, 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 you know, whatever we can do to help advance the case, to, to speed up the process of actually seeing new tracks put on the ground, that's what needs to happen. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Harkin. Uh, Councillor Heaney, Connor. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and like others, I'd like to thank Steve for his presentation. Uh, it was informative. Uh, um, seen a number of these slides uh, previously, but uh, the thing put together just you know, shows you the, the work that needs to, needs to happen. I suppose I want to focus on uh, two sort of elements of, of your presentation, Steve, and sort of a number of questions are around it and, and points they make just I suppose on the, the physical side and then I'll come back to some of the policy issues you, you mentioned um, obviously the gaps are stark and raising the maps you, you can't fail to see the, the underinvestment or the lack of any investment that there there's been in in this region over over decades so there there's a lot of work to do and a huge amount of, of money to be found to try and, and deal with that um, I know in terms of the transport hub uh, that now uh, that's now there, the and the business case that had to be put together, they put that down because it is a northwest transport hub. Connectivity with Donegal uh, was was included, and obviously that was connectivity by bus, um, and that there would be a new bus service bringing people from there, Kenny and elsewhere, uh, into the hub and connected in that way. So. Uh, if you were going to then take, extend that to a rail connection as well, then there needs to be new thinking and you flagged up the, the, the issues around some of the planning elements. But I wonder, have you thought about or, or considered or, or lobbied on the issue of, of A5 and, and a combination of, of road and rail on that particular development, which would, could cover the same route? Uh, I know I've seen in other countries where they, they've incorporated rail and the uh, an infrastructure system that is, is is primarily road, but you can run a train up the middle of it, you could even run a train on top of it, um, you know, above it uh, in some type of sky rail situation. So that, that that's a possibility um, worth even looking at and discussing. So I don't know if you have considered that. Obviously, you know, if we're looking at the, the, the Donegal side of this and further down the Western arc, uh, in, in the maps that you, you know, we're now dealing with, we had the NDP published yesterday, which is out to 2040 by the Irish government. Um, I have to say, despite all the trumpeting and media around it, it was very disappointing, both in terms of rail, but even in terms of uh, some of the all air infrastructure that it was flagging up. There was no new money. It was sort of repackaged uh, proposals that have already been made um, and just re-announced. So that doesn't give you great hope that there's there's going to be major financial contributions put on to try and address some of these issues coming from the current areas government. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that. And then obviously, you know, it was mentioned by Councillor Hargan. Look, we still have work to do on the existing uh, infrastructure in terms of phase three of the Derry to rail line, which will will be required if you're going to ensure that service is further upgraded and to both uh, half early and um, an express service, which is something I, I was pushing quite a bit when, when we had that department. So that, that's the infrastructure side, but just to uh, come back with some comments to you on the, on the policy issues you mentioned, there is a, a huge deficit in some of the policies and a clear bias towards Coleraine. Um, that has developed over many decades, and you can see that in some of the, the figures that you produced in relation to how many, what the, the times that you can get to Coleraine and not the dairy, uh, the frequency, uh, and all of that. Like I, I discovered during that time, the reason 
the you can get a letter train to Coleraine uh, than you can to Derry on, on a Saturday because that's where they overnight the train. Um, so they use from Coleraine first thing in the morning as well. So um, wh why that, is that the case, and wh why could it not be overnighted in Derry? Um, are, are obvious things. So there's a whole range and raft of things within that that are, that are policy decisions taken by TransLink and the Department of Infrastructure that could be addressed and, and refocused to try and place Derry uh, higher up. You know, it, it is the largest Connor Basin um, uh, in that area, and it, it, it should have the the full uh, the full suite of, of services. Um, why why a, a much smaller town and indeed a seaside village, as you say, and Port Rush has more services going to it than the major city is is a mystery, and all that are as policy decisions, nothing to do with the infrastructure. So um, I don't know what contact you've had, what sort of success you've had in terms of making those points to the department on the translink, but I'll be interested to hear it. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Heaney. Uh, Steve, that's four different uh, speakers uh, from a range of parties. So I'll bring you back in now if you want to address those uh, points from the four councillors, and then I'll bring back in the other indicated speakers after you've contributed. So go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks uh, for all the questions. The really, really good points, really good questions made there. So thanks, everybody, for contributing on that. Um, just to go through them in, in order, um, Councillor Edwards uh, mentioned three points. Uh, the first was around the All Islands. Uh, real strategy, which is happening. Uh, we're, we're very positive about that. We think it's the right thing to do. Real works best and most effectively as a network. Uh, and, and it makes sense to look at it at, uh, at what needs to be provided across the island, um, especially as there will be, uh, you know, we already have the Belfast of Dublin cross border route. We're pushing for Derry to Letterkenny cross border route. There could be other options, you know, whether it be Enniskill into Sligo or whatever. Um, so it definitely makes sense. To look at these things holistically on an all island basis so we're, we're we're glad that that piece of work is happening um i guess a couple of caveats on that would be um firstly that there's there's a bit of cynicism especially in the republic actually I, I've, I haven't really heard it in the north but there's a bit of cynicism in the south that um you know it, it, it's the old adage but the easiest way to delay something in in, in government is to uh put it out to review or, uh, or, or, you know, or get somebody in to look at it because you just kick it down, kick the can down the road, put it in the long grass, and then, you know, it just delays things. So there would be cynicism in the South that that's what the civil service is doing uh, by, you know, supporting all of that. Um, I'm not convinced of that myself. We've met with Eamon Ryan. We've met with uh, Minister Mallon in the North. Um, I think they're both sincere about extending rail. Um, and, and I think they pushed us through uh, and the civil service just have to get on and deliver it. Um, but that, that's the one caveat I, I, I would mention is that it's, it's you know, because what will really matter is what happens after this strategy is delivered. Uh, obviously, what's in it will be very important. And we're, 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 you know, we're quietly hopeful, quietly confident that it will uh, recommend some improvements in the Northwest, quite what remains to be seen. But uh, yes, yeah, so we need to see what's in it, but then it's the what next, because, Recommendations will have to be taken somewhere, will have to be funded, and will have to be delivered. And that's when things get tricky. It's very easy to do a study. It's much harder to, you know, for for uh, governments to put their hand in their pocket and start delivering. So, but overall, you know, we're very positive about it. Uh, and it's due to report next spring. I think it's due to come out prior to Perda ahead of the storm of the elections, which is important because otherwise it'll be delayed onwards. Uh, we th there's probably going to be a different uh, infrastructure minister after the next election. I, I I have no insights into that, but just that's kind of how Stormont probably works. Um, so you know, it'd be good for the out before the election, uh, so we can all see what that is planning and proposing, and then it'll be up to the next mandate after the election in May to see what can be done in terms of delivering against that. Um, your second question, Count Edwards, uh, was also reflected by Alderman McClintock, was around feasibility studies. Um, now. The kind of feasibility studies that the council could do, uh, which is similar to the one the ABC council are doing, are really just to get the boulder moving. If you think about real, you know, the hard bit is to get the boulder moving and then it starts to build its own momentum. In reality, the kind of feasibility studies that you're going to be doing if you're genuine about reopening a railway line are, you know, could cost millions. You know, you're talking uh, structural studies, you know, roads, uh, you know, bridges, drainage, all that sort of thing. 
really quite complex. And that's at the stage at which you know you're going to do a piece of work. So what 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 we're talking about in terms of feasibility studies is that initial getting the ball rolling, getting the ball the rolling, and also to push the agenda by starting to fill in some of the blanks around these issues. So we we would support and say there is a role for feasibility studies to play that we'd be keen to see the council uh, help make them happen. The, the, the downside is the DFI will not fund any more feasibility studies now until after the all island real strategy is completed. And that kind of makes sense because it would be a bit strange, you know, six months out from that study reporting to be spending money on studies that could then, the report could then turn around and say, not a snowball's chance in hell of that, that progressing. Um, but it's just frustrating because again, it means there's more delays. And again, it means Porta down Arma, which distress should reopen, definitely needs to happen. But means they're ahead of the game versus Derry Strabane versus Derry Letter Kenny. Um, so if the council could uh, push forward, put some, make some funding available, and get some feasibility studies done, it would help push the agenda. It would help focus minds. It would help people start to think maybe this isn't mad. Maybe this is something that could and should happen within my lifetime. Um, uh, but again, it would be just the first opening salvo. You'd never need to be furnished studies and everything else down the line on that. Um, final point from Councillor Edward was on the campaign for border rail in Scotland. Very briefly, similar to our railway lines, that was a line that closed in the 60s, connected the edge of Edinburgh right the way down through the Scottish borders. The Scottish borders, uh, until the line reopened, was the only region in Britain that didn't have rail. It reopened in 2015. Uh, a very key point, two key points on this. Firstly, reopening it was a political decision because the economic study claimed it wouldn't cover its face, it, would, it wouldn't wash its face economically. So the, the civil servants said, don't reopen this line, um, it's a waste of money. And the, the government in um, Holyrood basically said, well, no, we're going to reopen it because A, A, we think it'll do better, and B, you know, it's socially and economically the right thing to do. And then what happened is the passenger numbers proved to be significantly greater than the civil servants had factored into their uh, initial studies. So it's been a huge success. Um, they're now looking at a, a new phase two connecting the Scottish borders over to Carlisle in the north uh, west of England. Um, so really key point in that is it was a political decision to reopen that, not just not just uh, an economic one. Uh, the political decision was proven to be right because there's always, always a tendency, no matter where it happens, of passenger numbers being significantly underestimated when it comes to viability studies. And there are tons of examples of that. And thirdly, as you alluded to, Council Edwards, the biggest fine on that reopened route is Gala Shields. Gala Shields has a population just ever so slightly bigger than Strabane. It's 15,000 people, but it is smaller than Dungannon, smaller than Oma, smaller than Derry, significantly. And that was the biggest fine on that reopened uh, border railway route of about 30, off the top of my head, 35 miles or something. So if they can do that to Scotland and make it a success with pretty small towns, why can we not do the same in, in, in the Northwest with Letterkenny, Straban, Dungannon, Oma, and places like that? Uh, so it's a great example. We we, we, we got Camping for Border Rails over to speak at one of our meetings. We take a lot of inspiration from them. If they can do it, I, I see no reason why we can't. Um, Alderman McClintock, I, I, I've mentioned already the feasibility studies bit you, you, you raised. You also asked about DFI ministers. Um, we, we, we meet with DFI every so often. Uh, at the very least, to get up, upgrades or updates on the phase three work. Uh, we met with them last week. Uh, uh, Karen Phillips was there from the council as well. Uh, so we we're kind of a regular contact with them. One point I would flag up in this, um, I think I think the minister in the north is serious about real expansion. I personally am unconvinced that the civil service supports it. I just don't think they do. And I see no evidence to suggest that they do. Uh, and in fact, I see evidence that they don't. So I'll give you an example. Um, if we're going to bring rail back through to Rome, uh, it's going to be cover covering off not just Derry Shaban district, but also Fermanagh Oma district. We met with the chief executive of Fermanagh Oma about two months ago, and she told us in no uncertain terms that DFI told them there would be nothing about rail, rail restoration being put into the transport plan for their council area. So DFI have basically said, Oma, and for Mana, you're not getting real back. And therefore, their transport strategy is all about roads and a bit and a little bit about buses. And if we're not restoring real to Oma, 
you know, we might get it as far as Strabane from Derry that that might work from a viability case, but it's unlikely then to go further south in the district, uh, you know, to, to Newton Stewart and places like that. So that concerns me when other councils uh, who are keen to see rail restored as well are being told by DFI, don't put this in your strategy because we don't support it. So that's the real challenge. Um, and it's all very well for a minister to be supportive of something. Ministers come, ministers go. We all know that. Uh, and infrastructure works in very long time scales of decades plus. So I, I personally am not convinced that the civil service is supportive of this agenda. And I think there's enough evidence to suggest the opposite that they're actively unsupportive of it. Um, Councillor Harkin, um, yeah, you, you, you raised the point about the fact that you know we're just not reopening railway lines. It's important to remember the only part of either the UK or Ireland to not have opened, to not have reopened any rail lines so far this century is Northern Ireland. The Republic is doing it and plans more. Scotland's done it, or every English region's done it, Wales has done it. We haven't. And that's really telling because you know, even if you started tomorrow, you'd be a third of the way through the century before you reopen something physically, given the lead times. Uh, and we're not even at the stage of starting tomorrow. So we're very much being left behind as a region in Northern Ireland. And within Northern Ireland, we know the West is even further being left behind. Uh, so we really need to get on uh, uh, and tackle some of this. Uh, Councillor Heaney, uh, you mentioned DA5 uh, and the possibility of combining road and rail. Uh, that's a good point. Um, there, are, there are three options that we see for bringing rail between Derry and Straban. There used to be two different routes. One crossed over, uh, sorry, one started the Foyle Road and ran down through Cardigan's St. Johnson to Lifford and then crossed over to Straban from there. The other one uh, started in Victoria Road and then veered away from the A5 through Dunhamana and then Straban from there. Uh, so reopening either of those routes is a possibility. And then the third one, as you mentioned, is basically taking advantage of the A5 work to run the railway line either down the middle of it or ideally along the side of it so you can get people on and off easily. Um, so that, that could be a cost-effective way of doing it. Um, we're, 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 we don't have any particular uh, uh, you know, graph or any particular one of those options. We just want to see rail restored between Derry and Straban, and it's up for engineers and other people to work out what the best way of doing that is. Um, I guess what, what one minor point I would make is, if you think about it, even if we did go down the route of using the A5, you still have to get trains from Waterside Railway Station to the start of the A5, and which means you still have to get past where Clam Mill uh, are, have to get permission to build a very large block of flats. And if, and if you can't run it there, you're into really expensive options like platforms over the bridge or sorry, platforms over the river and crazy stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. It, it, there are three options to do this, but all of them, I guess, are, are, are contingent upon nothing blocking the route. Um, I think, uh, and then, sorry, the only other point I would make, uh, and you know, I, I, I'm personally very supportive of the A5 being upgraded. I think it's, it's beyond time that happened. I guess a minor point I would make is in terms of how we do economic viability and business cases on transport, and it's mostly about a combination of primarily of time saving but also a small bit around accident uh, uh, reduction. But the time saving aspect, the unfortunate bit is, once we improve the A5 road, the business case for rail through Tyrone is, is degraded because the, the, the time saving um, is declined because the road journey is, is shortened. And therefore, by switching people to rail, um, the way we work these things out, the case for, for rail gets dented a bit. Um, that's just a reflection of the bad way in which we factor in these things. Uh, and the bad way in which we do the economic viability. But I would hope in Northern Ireland we can do what they did in Scotland, which is take much broader decisions and say we're not going to just reopen rail on the basis of what the spreadsheet has told us from the civil servants. We're going to factor in social justice, uh, the climate crisis, and all those other things as well. Hopefully that answers everybody's questions. Um, and thank you again for asking them all. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, there are a few other indicated speakers we're still bringing in now. I appreciate your answers to date. Uh, I have Alderman Derek Hussey, then Alderman Keith Kerrigan, and then Councillor Sean Mitty. So go ahead, uh, Derek. Uh, thanks, Steve, for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, you've heard me before. Uh, I'm I'm one of the few who actually uh, would have used the old GNR. I was brought up in Oma, about 200 metres from uh, where the station is. Uh, and know that line, uh, uh, whether going to Belfast, uh, Dungannon, Portadown, 
and coming through here to London Derry to play rugby or whatever it was. But I also remember the very sad day when I was sitting down the old levels uh, in the gym at my academy and the train was coming along with a big hook on the back, pulling up the sleepers. And that was a very sad day, which probably leads me then into the first situation is the protection of a route. So it's the identification of a route that is then to be uh, protected. Uh, and before you do that, you need to have the commitment uh, to say, yes, we are going to uh, seriously consider uh, a proper rail route that's connecting, wh whether it's through uh, to Donegal and Letterkenny, or whether it's through to Straban, Oma, Dungannon, through to Portadown, the way the old GNR line went. Uh, so that commitment needs to be there. And, and I think that commitment is within this chamber. But is it within the FI? And you've rightly said civil servants can be a real problem here. Um, for my son some time ago, uh, when I was in the assembly, I sat on the old DRD committee. And I still remember the time that the committee came to Londonderry. Uh, uh, and it was a case of uh, coming to look at the line. Uh, so rather than them traveling by road, they were told to go on the train. And I think they got a real eye opener. And it was from that point on that we began to see a serious look at the line and at the rolling stock, or as they call it, train sets uh, that, that were being utilized along that line. So the improvement came when they had to experience it themselves with drafty windows and, and, and everything else that used to be the old line. Uh, so number one, then, uh, I think we're, we're looking at protection of our route and then the engineering items that go and follow that. Uh, to, well, number one, you've got the route. Now, how do we overcome whatever problems may exist along that? You, you've identified one issue there, and, and I suppose like Alderman McClintock, I have to declare on the planning committee, so I'm, I'm loath to consider the plan mail situation uh, because because there, there could be a conflict there. But um, you know that, that route protection to me is extremely important. Um, I have to concur fully with Councillor Heaney uh, because during my time in the DRD committee, uh, we did some study trips uh, to Europe and you had this idea of a transport corridor. Uh, uh, and to me, it seemed logical. Uh, rather than hanging your hat on road, you, you include rail within that. And again, that leads to another scenario. Are we talking light rail? For computer commuter purposes, are we talking heavy rail, which is necessary? Um, and I suppose you, you haven't you haven't distinguished there for the potential of a restoration of freight tra traffic. You know, I'm one of those who well remember the trucks rolling through Oma at night, uh, and a lot of that uh, freight traffic was actually off the roads because it was on rail. Uh, but modern day. Uh, transportation systems are slightly different, unfortunately. Um, north of the city, one thing that you didn't mention, uh, and I would like to be kept in mind, and that's foil port. Uh, and I suppose that ties in with my idea of, of freight transport. You, ha you have mentioned there the airport, and I cannot for the life of me understand why there isn't a stop at Eglinton Airport. That's another matter. Uh, but the airport and include foil port on that. Uh, not alone that, but I mean, there are cruise ships coming in, uh, et cetera, wh where there is potential there. Uh, can I be a bit pedantic and ask that in future, Newtown Stewart is spelt correctly? <laughs> it's not Newton Stewart, it's Newtown Stewart. And by the way, that occurs. Uh, there's an important issue of crossing the foil uh, to establish that Donegal connection. And again, that's part of the overall issue of protected route. Um, uh, and you have alluded to the costs there. But you know, until we know what the route is and what the problems are going to be to establish that, then we can be pragmatic and work towards the costs. A couple of minor points then on the six to fix, uh, you showed the stats of the number of trains going to Coleraine. And there was one there, there was two, two from uh, Port Stewart. Or Port Rush and, and one from the city. And I'm wondering 
of are they part of the stats then for cool rain above that where the two from uh port rush come into cool rain and then go on uh, and i'm presuming that the port rush ones would be reference students uh because there's quite a few students who actually live out in port rush but will be coming into to the university uh, so i'm presuming that the stats there i can't remember what how many it was from cool rain. it might have been four but i'm presuming that two of those port rush ones would have been then uh, added into uh, and similarly the dairy one you, you can understand and, and similarly with the other uh, comparisons but it doesn't take away from the fact that if the trains can go to cool rain why can't they come on through to the city uh, as part of that um and finally uh, you know i congratulate you on the work you're doing uh, and i suppose you know it, it's me thinking you mentioned a third of a century there uh, so if you got the go today and the diggers were setting up somewhere tomorrow what year would there be a train running <laughs> from waterside or from the city which i mean the trains gnr used to come in actually over at the foil uh railway station on the other side uh that's my memory of traveling down uh, but what year would we expect to see the first train rolling into Savan onto Newton Stewart. I'm not forgetting Victoria Bridge. There used to be a tram line <laughs> up to Castleberry. So perhaps you know the the integration of light and heavy rail, etc. Sorry if that's sort of all over the place, Steve. But I suppose you would argue well the whole thing's all over the place at the moment, and we need proper coordination. Put this all together. You're doing fantastic work. Others have to pull in uh, and pull the wit along the line. Thanks very much for the presentation, Stephen. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Alderman Hussey. Um, Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And I'm not a member of the committee, but I, I do. Thank you for letting me come in on the topic. And I suppose at the start, uh, the same as, as Alderman McClintock there, a uh, uh, member of the planning committee. So whether that needs to be declared there, whenever that decision was made in regards to the application, which has been referenced there, at, uh, uh, adjacent to the line. Um, but Chair, uh, we did, uh, I suppose, it was, it was Councillor Edwards who brought forward the motion in regards uh, to the council not that long ago, in regards to getting, uh, calling upon a feasibility study to get the line upgraded from Stavan to the city. And uh, I had put forward an amendment that we would seek to contact our neighbouring councils from Anoma and Mid Ulster in regards to uh, seeking will they get on board because I maintain, I still maintain a line from Stavan to, to Londonderry is really, that's a start surely, but that's, that's no good. You need the link up to take you on to port it down that that, that South West Ulster is, is uh, uh, linked in because I mean, realistically there, uh, I suppose I'm, uh, I'd be minded, you know, if we did have the link from Stavan down to the city, I would be minded if someone went into their van there, you would still get on a gold liner and you would still be in Belfast quicker than you getting uh, onto a train and their van and going the whole way around. You know, so it's still the bus is still going to be a quicker option. So you need the link up to try to entice. So I say, I, I, I thank you very much, uh, Steve, for the presentation. I missed the very start of it, but uh, uh, from what I saw, it was uh, very good. And as I say, it's, it's, uh, it's something that needs to be done, but we do need the buy in. I suppose you did mention in your comments earlier, and I suppose maybe that's maybe part, maybe it is kind of the answer. Um, we, we had as a council, when the motion was brought forward, by, by Councillor Edwards, we had wrote to our neighbouring councils, Mid Ulster and Fermanagh, Oma, and there was a response was just actually read out yesterday at the full council meeting, and Alderman Hussey referenced it, and it seemed a wee bit lukewarm from Fermanagh Oma in regards to it, and I suppose potentially you've already stated the fact is because Fermanagh Oma have just been told by the civil service effectively in the EFI that real is not going to be part of their plan, therefore they're not really buying into it. So I suppose that's just your thoughts on that. Have you had much of an, um, ha, have you had any discussions or have you had much of a discussion with the likes of Fermanagh Oma Council to get them on board or Mid Ulster to get them on board? And I know you're referencing to get the touch there or uh, 
to get across and, and to get on uh, to Latter Kenny, another major settlement there in County Donegal. Just wondering how much of a buy in have you had from Donegal County Council? Uh, you, you know, in that regard as well. So, no, I am content with what you're doing. And as I say, there is a lot of stops on that route, the, the, the Great Northern Line there is what it came down. And as you say, there was the options there of either New Buildings, Donamana, Cullion, round that way, or, or else come on in and next to the road. And I do think, as, as uh, Councillor Heaney has referenced there, you know, a link in with the, with, with, with the new road would be beneficial. But it's just the case too, and, and you, you have touched on it yourself, the improvements to the A5 will kind of lessen the case of it. And you really need, I mean, I would imagine how hey, you'll have the support of the council here. The council will support it, we see it, but you really need the the buy-in from Stormont. Would that be kind of fair comment? Because, you know, I I, I had ums to, to the Royal up in Belfast there recently, and I had a lot of trucks up and down that road. And to be fair, you know, once I get to Ballygolly, you know, it doesn't. You can go on that road rightly. You, you know, uh, you, you know, with the improvement from Dungannon to Ballygolly. Yes, it's slow from Ballygolly to Oma. And to be fair, there'll be a long time before the Drumcon Road, as we would reference it, from Castle Derg to Oma, has ever improved. But as I say, we can thaw, we have to, as it is. But it's the uh, it's it's getting that link. That is, I suppose, defeating your. You know, if we do get that road improved at some stage. It's kind of beaten, uh, as you say. It's it's knocking out the time, the time uh, saving, uh, the uh, the time saving. Um, uh, I suppose argument for real. But as I say, no, I I I think to be fair, you have answered some of the questions I was going to pose and previous answers. So I'm content to say thank you very much for the presentation. And there's just a couple of wee points there having that. But thanks very much, Steve, and thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. Okay, Keith, thank you for that. Uh, Madam Speaker, is uh, Councillor Sean Mooney. Sean. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Steve. I should say thank you for coming and presenting uh, to us today. And I'm not going to keep you much longer. I'm sure hopefully be straight to the point. But really, my focus is one when I read the, your presentation and when I heard you speak was really there seems to be the most um, pressing matter um, that could prevent or delay any further and progress on this matter, albeit until we see what the Bail and Review comes back with, is that issue of Clan Mill and the possible development um, on the Victoria Road. And in your view, if that goes up and if that's built, um, is that um, game over for any future prospects for Real Review leaving, um, leaving Derry City? Obviously, because when you look at the map, Derry at the minute is the end of the line when it comes to rail coming from Belfast. So. Um, just, I'd like to see, like, hear your views on what that would be, because obviously it may take any other considerations. How else would you address a rail line leaving Derry, going to Strabane or going to Donegal? Thank you, Steve. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for many. Um, Steve, back to yourself then to go through those three different speakers, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, start with Alderman Hussey. Uh, I'll go through some Quite a few points there, some good points. I'll, I'll go through them all. That's okay, uh, Derek. Um, protecting track beds uh, of the former rich. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, it's something that we've been um, requesting from the council. That's something I believe will be in the local development plan, which is under uh, consideration and, and progression at the moment. Uh, we would argue that it, it should be addressed more urgently. You can bring forward uh, supplementary planning policies uh, in isolation, and we would say that this needs to be done. You know, tomorrow, basically bring in something to protect, to to, to automatically protect all former track beds, uh, and then if somebody did want to do something on them, then that could be looked at. But the 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 um the bias or whatever the correct word is, that the, the assumption should be that former track beds uh, are, are sanitised and that nothing can be done on them, and that biases the time to either through feasibility studies or a real working group or whatever else to look at which of the former track beds. You know, realistically, are likely to be options, and which are probably never going to have real returning to them. But it's really important that 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 happens. Uh, we note that Donegal County Council has sanitised all the track beds in its area, and in particular has protected the last mile into uh, Letterkenny. So the port, uh, it's the Port Road, I think, in Letterkenny, where the bus station is. Um, the route right up to there for for rail, that former track bed is protected. So Letterkenny could. 
easily have Rio brought back into the town centre. Um, there's nothing to ensure that could happen in Straban or anywhere else within our districts currently. There is some Northern Ireland, Ireland wide policy, and this is where a, a bit of the controversy around the Clamwell decision arose about how applicable that should have been and whether it should have been factored in to the decision made in, in Derry Straban Council. But you know, we are where we are, and we think it should be spelled out in super clear terms that you're not allowed to build anything in our track beds. And then that buys us the time to look at uh, the whole thing in more detail. Um, I'll come on to Clan Mill uh, at the end in response to uh, Councillor Mooney's question. Um, you mentioned light rail versus heavy rail, uh, Derek. Um, personally, uh, I, I'm a fan of, of, of picking one type of transport, one type of rail and making it work. Uh, I'm not a fan of like, for example, in Dublin, where they seem to be, you know, chucking in completely different types, like tram, light rail, heavy rail, uh, you know, in, in various on the ground in various different places. I'm a fan of a single format that is fully integrated, uh, because if we had set a light rail connected into heavy rail and dairy, again, people would have to change from one system, tr walk some distance, wait, and get onto another system. I think you know, uh, heavy rail works. Um, it provides the capacity to, to move significant numbers of people between urban settlements. Um, and I would like to see Letterkenny to Derry, for example, connected or, or Straban to Derry connected by heavy rail, because then it's fully integrated and it can then be connected on uh, at some point in the future. Um, you mentioned freight traffic, uh, uh, rail freight. That's something we've uh, looked at uh, and continue to do so. Northern Ireland uh, doesn't have rail freight. It stopped doing it about 20 years ago. Uh, we had a good meeting with Foil Port last year where we were discussing with them to find out what they were shipping in and where it was going to uh, and what their attitude would be towards having a, you know, a freight hub there. And they're obviously open to anything which would improve uh, their port. Um, I would describe Foil Port. Uh, Foil Port's in a really unique position. It kind of has the, the proverbial full house of transport options. I mean, if you think about it, you have Foil Port in one uh, part of, of that broader Campsie Maiden area. At the other end, you have an airport. To the south, you have a dual carriage with A2. To the north, you have a railway line. And then obviously, you have the sea. So, pretty much every transport option is covered by Foil Port in a way that Belfast Port doesn't have, or Larne doesn't have, or, or, or uh, Warren Point doesn't have. So, we're, we're quite lucky in the northwest that our, our, our port does have really good infrastructure on its doorstep and a ton of land for development as well, including for a, a, a rail freight terminal. But again, um, I think our, our rail network is very limited. The stuff that comes into Foil Port goes to Donegal, Tyrone, and Sligo, and none of the rail goes to those areas, unfortunately. Uh, but the good news is that the public is uh, very serious about rail freight. Uh, the case has been made, and, and it was in the NDP yesterday, uh, for reopening uh, a second part of the Western Rail Corridor to connect Ballina into uh, Limerick, the port at Limerick and Foynes. Uh, because Ballina is the real freight capital of the Republic, because of Coca Cola and a few other things. Uh, real freight is growing the Republic. So, to cut a long story short, I believe the All Ireland Real Strategy will consider freight as well. And I hope at some stage down the line, through an expanded network, we can start moving some freight off of our roads, out of our towns and cities, and onto rail instead. Um, and then you mentioned the six to fix. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, if you want to get to Belfast before 9 a.m., there's four options from Coleraine, two from Portrush, one from Derry. Um, the two options from Portrush are direct. So you're getting on a train at Portrush and getting off at Great Victoria Street. And yes, they, they, they would be included in the figure for Coleraine, but it, but uh, regardless, there's still four options leaving Coleraine that will get you to Belfast. Uh, and Derry has only one, just as the same way as the Derry one would also be included in Coleraine because it's going through Coleraine. Um, but it's important to remember those Portrush trains are not changing at Coleraine. And I'm waiting for another train. They're direct connections from Portrush to Belfast. Before 9 a.m., there's two of them. And it's a small Victorian seaside town. Um, finally, um, you asked about if, if, if the button was pressed and work was to start tomorrow. Um, firstly, on that, uh, build out is probably, in terms of how things work generally, and if we're honest, how things work in Northern Ireland, build out is probably your quickest bit. Um, it, it'll be all the pre work. And the decision making and the allocation of funding and the presumable legal challenges which will happen, all those things are likely to add up to a greater chunk of time for the actual build time. And we've, we've seen that in the A5 and 
we saw that uh, for honest on, on on a section of the A6 as well. Um, I I would say if you, if you had uh, spades in the ground tomorrow, uh, I, I see no reason why you couldn't reopen the routes between uh, Derry and Portadown. All of the things been equal in terms of Clan Mill and where you were, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, certainly by the end of the decade. Um, beyond that, I'm not a, a civil engineer, um, so I wouldn't be the right person to ask. But you've been talking years, but not too many of them. Um, that whole route is only about 65 miles from memory. I can't see why you couldn't do that. I have it done and it within five years. I just can't see that. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask. I uh, hope that answer, answers your questions. Uh, Alderman Hussey, uh, Alderman Carrigan. Uh, yeah, you raised the point about you know a connection from Derry to Stravan isn't enough on its own. Uh, you know, we would definitely agree. I guess the one thing we would say is it's a start. Um, but you have to get you have the gap at the moment between Derry and Port of Down. Every little bit that closes that. So if you do Port of Down to, to Dungannon, Derry to Stravan, the, the the more you close that gap, the 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 greater it makes the likelihood of the rest of the gap being filled because it's cheaper to do it and it, and it increases demand for it. Uh, and don't forget that. People getting on the rail from Straban wouldn't only be about going to Belfast, so it might be quicker by Goldliner, but they may be going to Coleraine to study. They may be coming to Derry to study. They may be going to visit relatives in Balamoney or, or or wherever. Um, so again, rail, rail works best as a network. So it's not only about moving people from Straban to Belfast. It's about everywhere else that they can get to by rail. Um, you talked about uh, the Fermanagh and Oma. Uh, yeah, we, we so we've met with the chief executive of Fermanagh Oma Council. Uh, we've met with Donegal Council and we're in the process of meeting with Mid Ulster and Causeway Coast and Glens. We're sort of doing a, a steady sort of a parade around all the, all the key stakeholders. Uh, Donegal Council, very keen on rail. Um, if, I mean, if we're honest, all, every council wants better rail. I mean, that, that, that's, that's obvious. It's like, you know, the proverbial motherhood and apple pie. All councils want better rail. I guess the question I would raise is how much do they want it and are they prepared to fight for it? Because make no mistake, there will be a battle here. The civil service and the DFI, from everything I've seen, are not supportive of enhanced rail in the west of Northern Ireland. Now they won't come out and say that, but you know they'll drag their heels, they'll kick things into the long grass, they'll be you know broadly uh, passive aggressive and unsupportive about it. But it will, th th there will be a battle here. Nobody's going to turn up tomorrow and give us rail between Derry and Port Down on a plate. We're going to have to fight for this. And I guess that's the question. How much does this council want it? Because if it doesn't fight for it, if it just thinks passing policy in, in a chamber will make it happen, it won't. It needs to get out there, make the case, be ambitious, uh, be vigorous about chasing it. Uh, take a leaf out of the example of, uh, like I said, ABC Council who are, are, are proactive, but I would go beyond that. You know, Let's make sure that the, the first New bit of rail reopened this century in Northern Ireland is in our district. Let's make that our aim as a council and let's go out and make sure that happens. Um, then, Councillor Mooney, um, yeah, you raised about Clan Mill and whether, whether that building would be game over. Um, personally speaking, I suspect it will on the basis that if you go back to the maps earlier and if you start with a principle of a single central station for, for the city, which realistically will be the water side. And if you accept that you can't cross the river north of Craig Avon Bridge because the space isn't there and the angles aren't there, then the only way you're going to get rail south to Tyrone and south and then west to Donegal is to pass through the Clanmill site. So the other options involve, you know, putting platforms over the foil. Uh, and bear in mind, rail is heavy. I mean, it's, it's very, very heavy. So if you're building the heavy platforms over out under the river, you're getting it into big engineering solutions, which are really costly. And the economic viability of doing so just to bring rail to Letterkenny or to Japan is going to be blown out of the water. So that's why I, I, I can't see it being viable if Clanmo build a structure. Just a quick update on where that all is. We've met with, uh, we had a chat with uh, John Kelpie, Karen Phillips. We've met with Clan Mill. We, we've been in discussions with the Minister for Infrastructure and DFI. Um, what we're trying to do is to negotiate a solution here, whereby one of two alternatives happen. Either, because, sorry, everything is in Clan Mill's court. They have planning permission to build that structure. They could break ground and start building it tomorrow, and nothing can be done to stop them, unless the will is there to compulsorily purchase it, 
uh, which uh, I, I don't believe, well, it isn't there. We've been told about a DFI, it isn't there, and I suspect it's not there from the council either. So what we're doing is trying to pursue one of two alternatives. Either a clan mill redesign their building and leave a strip uh, clear uh, between the, that building and the river so that real in the future could run along there. And then they can make it a nice sort of grounds and garden for their, for their residents in the meantime. And then it means that option remains open. On the second alternative we're pushing is, is you know, to, for them to find an alternative site uh, at, that they can transfer their ambitions to on that. And we'd be very keen for the council to assist them in that, either potentially through a land swap or, or through whatever. But those are the two options which were we've we've mentioned to them. Um, and I need to follow up with with uh, John Kelpie and, and Karen Phillips on those uh, because Clan Mill are open to having those discussions. They will do so without prejudice. They have the right to build that building and at the moment. That is their plan, and they want to provide uh, those thirty nine social housing units in our city. Uh, but they're at least open to having that discussion. So let's see where that goes. But I personally cannot see how you're going to get real from Waterside Station south towards Tyrone and Donegal without going through that Clamwell site. So if that building is built as currently proposed, I just can't see how it will ever get real extended from our city and by default into Tyrone, Fermanagh and Donegal. Uh, hopefully that answers all the questions, Chair. Thank you, Steve, and I appreciate your time. I know this is quite a lengthy uh, but engaging conversation about the future of rail uh, in the Northwest. Uh, I have another indicator speaker, it's Alderman Ryan McQuady, uh, and then I'll bring you back in, Steve, just to wrap things up at that stage. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a proposition for uh, this committee. Um, I'll submit it on the, uh, the box and allow people to read it and hopefully call for a seconder, and if you allow me to speak on that thereafter. Yeah, member, I see it. Uh, thanks, uh, Ryan. I see it has been seconded by Alderman Brown Kentuck. Uh, before you speak to it, I'm also conscious that we do have an item on the agenda here today, item seven, uh, which is a strategic rail um, proposal. So, um, if you're content to, to hold that until we have that presentation, and I'm bringing in at item seven, that's okay, Alderman McCready. Sure, just, I have no problem. Because we're, we're just currently in the stage of the deputation, so uh, I want to be fair to Steve, but also to the agenda that we have. So we have a paper on today's agenda. So if you can hold that proposal until we have that uh, paper, and then I'll bring you in to make that proposal, then if you wish at that stage, are you content enough with that, Alderman McCready? Yes, absolutely. As long as it gets tabled, you know, throughout our, our business here today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is on the agenda. Yeah, I'll come to that at item seven. Okay, so just very quickly to the deputation here. Uh, Steve, it's good to see you again. Thanks for your presence and you know your detailed uh, illustrations, data analysis to help us with uh, framing the conversation and the decision making where we can within our remit and champion this uh, as a council and hopefully take a formal position uh, as that uh, later on in this uh, committee meeting. Uh, it's insightful stuff, and I welcome further, uh, you know, lengthy conversation debates and just brainstorming in general to to make things happen, as opposed to just talking about it and going away and not revisiting it with any more meaningful follow up. So, uh, certainly, my pledge uh, to you and those with into the West and my constituents is is to make decisions and to move this along, so that hopefully, whether it's my children or my grandchildren, can get on a, a train and go elsewhere around the country or further afield, then that would be ideal and great. So thanks to the deputation. I look forward to uh, proposing this as the meeting goes on. Chair, thank you very much for allowing me in. No problem, Alderman McCready. Um, and Jen, just to draw this part of the deputation meeting to a close, uh, can I also uh, just uh, thank you again, Steve, for uh, not only coming along today, but for the duration of time that you've put into uh, preparing for today and then taking questions from elected members across uh, the chamber, both virtually and uh, in the physical chamber here uh, this afternoon. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, as I indicated, there is an item on today's agenda, item number seven, which I know, Steve, you're aware of, uh, that's coming up. So uh, we'll uh, we'll come to that very soon. Uh, we have item five and six ahead of us, and uh, and then I'll bring in Alden McCready uh, when we've dealt with item seven, uh, if he wants to make that proposal at that stage. Um, so, members, um, moving on then to item five um, is the chairperson's business. 
Uh, members, I don't have any chairperson's business uh, for today's meeting, uh, so that moves us on to item six, which is the matters arising from the open minutes of governance and strategic planning, which was held on Tuesday, the seventh of September, uh, and the minister attached. Uh, can we take them for accuracy at this stage? That's uh, pages twenty-five to sixty. If I can have a proposal for accuracy, please. Proposed Alderman Devaney, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. And the seconder, please, uh, Councillor Farrell here in the chamber is indicating his happy to second. Uh, any matters arising from those minutes? I don't see anyone in the chamber. I just give it a minute in case somebody has a point in the chat box, but I don't see any items coming into the chat box either, so no matters arising from the minutes. Uh, and that brings us on now to item seven, uh, which is the strategic rail um, proposal. So I'm going to um, hand over to the chief executive just to talk us through item seven. John. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, members. Um, members, we've obviously had a very lengthy uh, conversation led by uh, Stephen and to the West um, on the entirety of the rail issue, which is incredibly informative, um, as always. Um, so I'm not going to go through the detail of the paper, um, but I did think um, it was worthwhile just um, uh, looking at the, the fairly complex strategic policy environment within which all this sits, um, both in, in the recent past and, very importantly, what's coming up uh, in the months ahead. Um, and there are sort of there are seven areas where Council has been active, um, very active indeed. Uh, recently and presently and in the months ahead in looking at the strategic rail debate. If we go back to the strategic growth plan um, back in 2017, it was an aspiration in the strategic growth plan that rail services were extended at that time that the new railway station be built, um, which, as we know at that stage, um, had not been determined, that early services were put in place to Belfast and, and that there were onward connections to Dublin. Through the city deal process, although it wasn't a city deal project, um, like the roads, rail was always promoted by council as being a key enabler project to the wider growth plans. Phase three in particular, um, and feasibility studies um, beyond the city to Letterkenny and Straban. Um, most recently, the Northwest Regional Development Group and the Northwest Strategic Growth Partnership um, set out a position paper and submitted it to the North South Ministerial Council, setting out the priorities for the Northwest. And it was very clear in that paper that we set out the priorities for the strategic growth of rail, the extension of rail into Donegal and down to Dublin. There are two policy reviews um, currently underway at the moment that have been mentioned. The strategic rail review, um, probably one of the most significant um, pieces of work that's underway at this moment in time led by, as you know, Ministers Mallon and Ministers Ryan. The consultants have been appointed to that, and there was a presentation into the Northwest Strategic Growth Partnership in June of this year. Um, and it was highlighted during that meeting that formal engagement with the councils and the stakeholders in the Northwest during this process is absolutely paramount. Um, both governments on that call agreed that they would formally um, consult with the Northwest. We have recently um, put a letter into the system to make sure that's been formally recorded. And I think it's absolutely vital that we do get that formal um, uh, opportunity uh, to express our views into that process. Um, if there's anything we're going to do in the next couple of months, it's engaging formally in that process because that's the key. Uh, policy direction that will guide this going forward. The other very, very important policy work that's underway by DFI at the minute is the new, what's called the RSTNTP, the Regional Strategic Transport Network Transport Plan, bit of a mouthful. Um, it's being developed at the moment. It's road, rail, air, uh, all of that. Um, we've made submissions into that. It will be published in early 2022. And it's absolutely vital, again, in terms of rail, um, that we engage with that process and make our views known into that process. And then there are a number of other um, uh, 
policy documents. There's the local Northwest transport studies and the Northwest transport visioning piece that the council's about to take forward. So members, this council is very active in the rail space. It is very active in promoting strategic rail. You have been very active in that space. We are indebted to the support of Into the West and the work that Into the West has done, and Steve and Jim and Eamon before him in particular. And we work um, hand in glove with colleagues in Into the West to ensure that um, the strategic um, ambitions of the region are taken forward. And there have been some successes, as we've pointed out, the transport hub, new rolling stock, the early service to Belfast. But as Steve has said in his presentation, the key issues going forward are to establish within those policy documents commitments to feasibility studies going forward. That, in my view and an officer's view, is the key work of this council in the months ahead to ensure that we are formally consulted with and engaged with those two policy documents. I think if we can achieve that, we will have achieved a significant amount and would have gone a long way in ensuring that the feasibility studies that were uh, discussed uh, during that presentation will be taken forward because it's very important that those feasibility studies are taken forward with departmental blessing and that the department uh, or departments of both governments ideally are engaged in those feasibility studies um, with council supporting that. A council-led feasibility study without departmental engagement um, would be not futile but certainly suboptimal um, and we do need to have the departments um, leading on those feasibility studies and heavily engaged with council supporting. Members, um, the rest of the paper is self-explanatory. Um, the issue um, that was raised um, in the presentation with regard to um, track bed protection, um, clearly it's one that we um, are considering through the LDP process. Clearly there is um, some urgency to consider that. And members, I would um, suggest we will bring back a future paper um, with regard to the complexities of that, the opportunities involved in that, and what we might be able to do in the near and medium term um, to achieve those objectives, because it is, again, quite a complex area of planning law uh, and quite a complex area to navigate through. Nonetheless, um, as has been mentioned by members, um, it's an area of great ambition by Council, and we do need to do all we can uh, to, to ensure that um, we protect for the future. Um, so we will bring you back a paper um, that sets out all the issues associated with that for you to take some um, decisions in respect of it. So members, that's, um, that wider context in particular of the strategic policy making environment and the, um, and the key suggestion that we, um, we remain involved strategically with those two big reviews that will be um, we'll be concluding in the months ahead. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Chief Executive. I am open it up to the floor then to speak to item seven, and I know from the deputation that Alderman McCready has indicated uh, he wishes to come in. So, uh, Ryan. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the Chief Executive and the report. Uh, it's very timely. I like the fact that it coincided uh, with the, the previous deputation. And I'd like to thank officers for the strategic, the strategic communication engagement that they've been doing throughout the, the stakeholders, at which we're all involved. You know, including the two policy, uh, which are the ongoing policy developments, which is critical and crucial to everything we do thereafter. So uh, I support the recommendations within this paper, and how I understand this to date as I read it is this is council officers' engagement, and what I want to do with. My proposal is to not only reaffirm, uh, but reinforce and give the council officers that backing from members to say, look, we are supportive uh, as a co council in terms of our corporate position. And also that sends out a, a strong message to those other stakeholders in the other side of the table from our council officers and chief executives to say, you know, members are, are behind us. This isn't going away. And they could send a message through to other council areas who are connected to our aspirations geographically in Rio and elsewhere. So I, I, I looked at it in great detail to find out where would be appropriate to come in. So I'm thankful for the guidance 
uh, from the chair in this instance to bring it in under this item. So I do think that there's two parts to this uh, from a member's perspective to reinforce what has been done to date, but also in moving forward to strengthen that position from our council with members back. And I think to this point, uh, you have had other uh, initiatives and motions which are green orientated or CO2 emission orientated with this one is spe a specific relation to the real, where it does feed into other, aspe other aspects of uh, multimodal um, transportation throughout the city district and beyond. So I do think there is merit still within to establish that direct working group. So that when the chief executive uh, mentioned when he brings back those detailed areas of issues, concerns, then I believe the forum should be perhaps in that type of working group because it is such a big issue. It wouldn't really warrant it to, to fall over onto the governance and strategic planning, albeit, you know, I'm clearly officers would probably bring that working group if it was um, accepted by members here today under the, the guise of GNS as a committee or sorry, as a working group. Um, that's kind of my rationale and thinking to share with members and to get the feedback and hopefully the buy in from members that this is such a big ticket item uh, for it to be included in that manner. Uh, thanks for uh, second my or this proposition for Alderman Clintic and for accepting it uh, as the chair. I'm happy to hopefully open that up for discussion and see how we get on. Thanks, Chair. Yep. Thank you, Alderman McCready. Uh, can I just I suppose clarify uh, your proposal that's on the screen uh, before us? Is that in addition to 5.1 that is recommended in item seven? Because I know they're uh, they're obviously on the same subject matter. Um, Yes, Chair. So I looked at this when when we when we deferred it to this, and I, of how was it complementary, or is it? I think they're two distinct aspects. So if, whether this proposal is taken separately from recommendations, that one, I wouldn't necessarily see it as a replacement or a duplication. Five point one stands in its own merits of what has gone on, and you know those needs and the publications they are in. But I think the forum for it to be communicated and that discussion with members is within a working group. So I know there's this proposal is on the table, so I don't want to interfere with your procedures as a chair. Um, but I'm happy to either accept that 5.1 recommendation before this or deal with this one, which is on the screen, which deeply connected to it. But it's in terms of the output of creating that working group to discuss the, the, these areas in more detail as they are. You know, fairly comprehensive in terms of the policy implications and the connection with planning and LDP and so on. So, from from my point of view, chair, that, that you've asked me, I see these as as two separate. Well, the recommendation therein from the officer, which we will come to and I accept, um, but also this proposal, which I'm putting towards members um, as the forum to continue this on in greater detail. If that makes uh, sense, thanks. No, thank you, Alderman McCurdy. Uh, does it just for the process of uh, of proceeding, we just needed to clear uh, that up. Uh, so there's the proposal that's on the floor has been moved and seconded. Um, so we'll open that up to conversation across the chamber um, in, in relation to uh, the proposal that Alderman McCready has put. Uh, Councillor Boyle, John. Thanks. Um, thanks, Alderman McCready, for bringing that forward. Obviously, um, you know, Chair, we're, we're we're always interested in, in formulating working groups and, and considering pathways forward for anything that can bring a positivity to uh, the citizens of our city and district um, and across it. Um, I had, uh, during the presentation from into the West, I'd also um, thought about some of the other questions, but uh, we, we had a lengthy enough conversation, I thought. Um, but one of the very obvious things is that, you know, the proposed rail routes, as were discussed, traverse a significant number of different um, county councils, cross-border county councils, uh, not only just Donegal actually, but if the ambition was to reach, reach Sligo, I would imagine it has to go through Leitrim uh, and indeed Sligo to get there, um, not to mention uh, those on the side of the border. But anyway, that's by the by. And I was actually, I was going to uh, seek that clarity myself from, from Alderman McCready uh, in relation to 5.1, because I did see that there was a potential there for uh, as to be doing and saying the same thing in some parts of this proposal, but something different in, in 5.1. Uh, in relation to just some clarity moving forward, and it's a question for the Chief Executive, I suppose, um, 
uh, and and that would be, uh, in my experience, and and uh, of of working groups are that working groups really only contain the elected member members from this um, council, uh, and that that working group then only ever consults um, with outside bodies, organisations, partners. Um, uh, and is that not already what we're proposing in five point one? That's that's kind of my question. I don't I don't know the answer, and I'm not sure that Alderman McCready cleared that up for me um, specifically uh, the way I would need it. But as I said, we're we're all for working groups, but they have to be working groups that deliver something to you at the same time, Chair. So it's just one for think all of us to think about. Thanks for that, Chair. Um. Okay, go ahead, Ryan, and then bring in Councillor Heaney. Okay, uh, and thanks for your uh, forbearance on this one. So, the I do agree with uh, Member Boyle. So, everything that the council does when it does external communications, whether it's negotiation, uh, communication engagement, whatever the case may be, then they do so, but with the backing of members. And I'm not suggesting that within uh, my proposal here that it's it's a working group either consists of or engages externally, it's for members to discuss all the relevant details that's brought back from the likes of the, where the chief executives highlighted in 5.1. So I'm just uh, suggesting this is the forum to do it so that all members have access and it is uh, narrowed to a point where it's within within real and the aspirations of of hopefully all, you know, all councillors to, to expand are real and network throughout um, province locally, regionally, and beyond. So I see two aspects to it where the former of 5.1 is council officer business, external uh, engagement, communication, and and looking at the heaps of data and analysis to bring you know, forward that detailed uh, analysis and reports and, and further recommendations. But uh, where it leads over to the working group is where that's where it comes to because it's not, I don't believe this is going to be as simple or as short term as what we've dealt with in the past with other aspects because of the implications of, of real expansion and, and which has all been articulated by uh, the deputation, chief executive and many members. Um, so this is about longevity and keeping it focused and so we can keep uh, up to date with what, what the chief executive won and the outputs and the information to be brought into a forum and a working group members to be consulted and where necessary make decisions and shape our council's position and our and championing moving this forward and that, that's all i can do to articulate that i maybe um, i'm happy for anybody else to to jump in and our chief executive to maybe look at from an officer's perspective to see you know am i talking nonsense in, in the most uh, polite way thanks chair <laughs> No, that's okay, Councillor uh, or Alderman McCready. Uh, I'll bring in the other interested councillors uh, before we go back to officers, I suppose. Uh, Councillor Heaney, Connor. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and it was in a similar vein. You no, know, I think we're certainly uh, content to support 5.1 and and the proposal, but there is a, just a wee bit of clarity needed in relation to that. The, the value I had seen in, in the proposal is the, the need for expertise. You know, Steve acknowledged in his presentation on a number of occasions that he's not a civil engineer. Um, if we are going to be formulating policy decisions and taking decisions as a council in relation to uh, this issue, we need expertise that, that knows what they're talking about in this particular thing. So the value of the working group or the input into the working group uh, would come from those quarters where they're giving us clear information on the practical nature of, of where and how you could you could bring about some of these things. So if that's what this group is, is formulated to do, I can see merit in that. And that would give us as members then the, the proper information to take policy decisions uh, for this council. So thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Heaney. Um, any other interested speakers on the motion that's ahead of us at the moment? And I'm just giving it a minute for the chat box as well. I don't see any other interested comments coming in. So, John, is there any additional points of clarification you want to give in relation to uh, some of the questions that have been asked? Asked of me, Chair. Um, 
I think the only question I, I heard was from Councillor Boyle, and I'm just not 100% clear, Councillor Boyle, on what you're asking. Was it the, the makeup of working groups? The normal makeup of working groups, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, so, so we've got quite a few working groups at the moment, um, uh, and the normal makeup of working groups is that, um, well, we bring a paper back with the terms of reference, firstly, for what the working group sets out to achieve, ask for um, nominations from members, and then we provide um, the relevant officers to, to help guide that working group. The working group then normally brings in or invites in at discrete points um, other expert opinion, or um, it invites in stakeholders or other parties uh, to to um, give advice to the working group, or indeed the working group would recommend that those stakeholders or expert parties may um, come directly into a committee. Um, so that's that's generally how working groups have been running to date. Go ahead. Thanks, I, I, thanks, thanks for that, Chair. And that's how I understood it to be. Um, and I, so I appreciate that. Uh, that degree of clarity from the chief executive as well, and I think um, perhaps uh, for the benefit of everybody now, we know how it is. We want to progress this, um, and it wouldn't be any anything differently to to um, to uh, to how we normally do work in groups. Uh, just to say, I, I fully concur with um, Councillor Heaney on this as well, and that is that the level of expertise that we need here is not present in the body of this chamber, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and if, unless we had that level of expertise and advice coming our way, then you know it, I, it, we'd be running into danger of just having another talking shop. Uh, and I know we all don't want to have that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Thank you, uh, Councillor Boyle. I, I don't have any other indicated speakers on this, so uh, I'm not hearing anybody coming in to speak against the the proposal, other than asking for clarification, which has been provided in relation to it. So. Um, unless people alert me now, I'm going to take that uh, as unanimous. Just give it a minute in the chat box. So, oh, sorry, Councillor Farrell, go ahead. I, I would just like to ask one question on, on Alderman uh, McCready's proposal. It says all member rail working group. Does that mean that every member in the council can sit on it or it's the current arrangement of one pair party and one from the independent block. Uh, so I'd appreciate some clarity on that. Thank you. Alderman well, McCready, is there any additional points you want to make on, on that particular point from Councillor Farrell? Chair, I for a question like that in because there was issues in previous um, formations or working groups and, and other things like it. And because it's real and everything else, it's I didn't want to exclude anyone that weren't from a particular party or, or a block. So I, I don't have a decision on this. Whatever the, the procedures or members think is best, you know, I we all have a common goal and a common purpose here. So I'll leave that to the judgment of the, the chair, the chief executive. I, I, or if there's an issue with interpreting uh, all member, I just think if you're a councillor for this area, then you should be entitled to contribute, listen in, or, or take part you know, in some of the conversations to, to shape this policy, or if we're having, you know, a, an invite of the engineers, the expertise, or anyone else, then, you know, they, they should have access to it as well. So I, I don't think it's it's my prerogative to make that decision um, other than what's in that proposal. So I don't want to take any liberties here. So chair, it's, it's your call. Okay, thanks for that. I suppose it's, um, it's the fact that the text is on the screen is what we have to go with. So. Um, it would be um, some review of mine in relation to the importance of rail uh, being open to uh, all the councillors across the council area, but I'm conscious that's not what the text says at the moment. Um, so I suppose you need to bear that in mind, Alderman McCready, uh, in relation to uh, the scripting of the, the proposal that's on the screen. Um, I see Councillor Donnelly wants to come in, so I'll bring him in and then I'll go back out to the floor again. Uh, Gary? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just to uh, commend Alderman McCready on on the all mem all member aspect. You know, uh, there's no reason why any member of this council shouldn't sit in in this working group. We've seen in the past where people have excluded 
uh, councillors, particularly independent members, where one uh, independent member was forced to represent or, you know, the, the views of others. Uh, we then seen the, the working group on Irish unity, where it was open to everyone and, you know, the council didn't fall down or nobody get denied or mandate. So, you know, I think it's important to be inclusive here. Okay, thanks for that, uh, all, our councillor Donnelly. Uh, in order for clarity, clarity, would it be useful, uh, Alderman McCready, if you inserted the word all council members uh, in the uh, in the first line, just to make it clear, this or all elected members, uh, something like that would would just give the clarification that is required because I'm conscious there will be and uh, there will be councillors and aldermen who aren't on this committee who will have this paper presented to them for full council. So I'm trying to just get clarity uh, in relation to that. So um, it's your proposal, uh, Alderman McCready. So I think the any amendment to it would have to come. Okay. From yourself, if you're happy, just to add in the word "all elected members" uh, at the start, perhaps might bring a degree of okay. clarity for everyone. Yes, chair, I have no issues with it. With to this uh, to to make it work for all. Um, yeah, so, but uh, just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, are we in danger of? Is this not precedent, or because from my understanding, precedent has been set in the past. Um, with with things like this, which generally fall not not as neatly within our directorates and committees, and so on, so it doesn't really affect that issue of um, the hunt and nominations and, and representation based on proportional uh, voting and, and all that type of stuff. So, look, I, I'm not trying to create a stir here, Chair. I, I just really want to to to, to work collaboratively, collaboratively with with all and if elected members who. Have an interest in this and move it forward. Yeah, personally, I don't have an issue, but I just want to make sure I'm not in breach of any of our standing orders or, or procedures and, and all that type of stuff. Thanks. I know I appreciate that, uh, Alderman McCready. Um, okay, members, there's a proposal on the floor now, which has uh, received a fair degree of clarification from across the chamber. So, uh, are members content with the proposal that's on the screen? If not. Please make your views known now, either in the chamber here physically or on the chat box. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone speaking or indicating the wish to speak against this, so I'm going to take that as uh, as as on the screen as approved unanimously. Um, and then before we move off item seven, then just to also clarify that uh, the recommendation five point one again. Members content with that recommendation, uh, Councillor Farrell. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. I just like to speak briefly on the actual recommendation. Uh, I think everybody in the chamber is fully aware of, of the enormous potential of um, ex expanding and extending the rail network and the northwest, and the, the enormous opportunity that the All Ireland Strategic Rail Review presents. Uh, for citizens in the Northwest Ireland. And I would like to take this opportunity to praise Nicola Mallon, uh, the Infrastructure Minister, who actually made sure that Derry is included in this review. It should be remembered that it was originally envisaged that it was Belfast, Dublin, and Cork. Uh, and the Infrastructure here, and Infrastructure Minister, um, from the executive ensured that Derry was included in that review. So I think that that's something that should be welcomed and that should be something that is recognised as well. And I'd also like to note three feasibility studies uh, that Nicola Mallon has introduced or launched uh, during her tenure as the Infrastructure Minister. She's launched the feasibility study into phase three of the Derry Coleraine upgrade, and we expect um, movement on that uh, next month. And she also has feasibility studies for rail halts at Shafoil, Ballykelly, and the airport, which all makes sense. And she also has a feasibility study out for half early services uh, between Derry and Belfast. So I think those will all. Um, improve the connectivity of this region uh, and um, 
improve the environment as well. So I think uh, the minister should be applauded uh, for those interventions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Andrew Farrell. Um, in making that, are you happy with recommendation 5.1? Yeah, I'm happy to propose. And Councillor Boyle, happy to second any dissent in relation to that item. I'm not seeing anyone in the chat box or in the room indicating otherwise. I'm going to take 5.1 as unanimously agreed as well. Members, it's just gone uh, temp about 10 to 6, sorry, 10 past 6. So, uh, as in keeping with other uh, chairs, uh, we'll take a break after the two hour mark to allow people a comfort break. And I'm going to see you again here just at 20 past 6. Thank you.
we'll we'll reconvene now. Um, can I add that we've noted uh, Councillor Doyle has joined us uh, virtually as well, so Councillor Doyle will be added to the attendance list. Uh, members, we'll reconvene at uh, where we left off, which is item eight. I'm going to hand to Rachel to take this. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this report, um, and this report has been prepared following the July Full Council. Um, there was a motion put to uh, Full Council held on the 21st of July. It was passed, and it's featured there in 3.1 of your report. And it's in relation to the establishment of a new decade, new approach working group. So it's been considered and in line with what has been customary um, uh, within Council, but obviously subject to discussions today. Um, we're suggesting that uh, we would seek nominees for this working group, um, and that would be from one political party and one independent member to this working group. But obviously, that's obviously for discussion today. Um, the draft terms of reference has been prepared, um, and that's attached to Appendix 1 for members' consideration. And obviously, that will be considered by the working group whenever it's, uh, it holds its inaugural meeting. So, just in the interest of brevity, Chair, the recommendation in front of you today is uh, to nominate to that working group, the New Decade New Approach Working Group. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Rachel. I'm going to open it up to the floor and to the chat box. I am in the case of speakers, Councillor John Boyle and then Councillor Doyle. So, John. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just straightforward nomination. We'll nominate Councillor Brian Tierney for this working group. Thank you for that, John. Um, Councillor Doyle, do you want to speak to your uh, comment in the chat box or will we just take that as read? You, you don't want to speak to it? Okay. Uh, Councillor Doyle is indicating in the chat box for those who may not have seen it uh, that he is proposing that we have um, um, on the, the terms of reference 3.2, like would like propose a quorum or six. Is there a seconder for that proposal? Chair, do you want to do you want uh, do you want to speak now, Councillor Doyle? Chair, I'm happy to second this. Okay, you're happy to second Councillor Doyle's proposal that we limit that you just make the quorum six, not the not the membership, but the the, the quorum. Sorry, ca Chair, cancel that. I wasn't reading the chat box. I was reading the the paper. My apologies. Okay, uh, so just for clarity, we have a poser from Councillor Boyle that the SDLP nomination would be Councillor Brian Turney. So I'm going to just take that one now for uh, for due process. So can I have a seconder for that, uh, Councillor Farrell? Um, in terms of other nominations, um, I'm not seeing. Sir, Alderman Devaney here. I nominate Alderman McClintock. Okay, thank you for that, uh, and I. I I appreciate you put that in the chat box, Alderman Devaney. Thank you for that. Uh, is there a seconder for Alderman McClintock? I'm happy to second that. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, and Councillor Heaney here in the room, Connor. Mr. Chair, uh, can I nominate Councillor Duffy? Uh, the working group. Thank you, and again a seconder, Councillor second Fleming. Well, thank you sure. for that. Um, Councillor Doyle's proposal in the chat box. I'm consciously indicating he's having some connection issues. Uh, he's indicating that the, that we would accept that the quorum of that group is six members. Content that that's the quorum because that needs uh, to be seconded. I'm not seeing anyone indicate a seconder for that. Um, so unless there's a seconder for it. I'm going to have to let that go, Councillor Doyle. Um, and I see in the chat box as well uh, that Alderman McCready is, in, is indicating that he wishes to nominate himself. Is there a, you know, a seconder for Alderman McCready, Councillor Boyle? Second that, that Alderman Devaney. Okay, thanks for that, Morris, as well. Okay, members, not seeing any other indicated speakers or nominations, so I'm going to take that as agreed and move on to item nine. Um, through you, Chair, um, the purpose of this particular report is to inform members and seek their approval for the proposed program of events connected to the uh, uh, Local Democracy Week 2021 
As members uh, would be aware that we have a long track record in terms of local democracy week and obviously um, aim it, that aims to uh, raise young people's awareness of how local councils work. COVID has, has obviously had an implications for the programme, um, but details of the proposed uh, way forward for 2021 are, are set out in your appendices. And, and fundamentally, all of this is looking at encouraging um, young people to participate in local democracy and also to promote engagement with the mayor and elected members. The recommendation in front of members and, uh, today are, is that members uh, get involved in the Promoting Local Democracy 2021 initiative and adopt the proposed programme and any costs associated with it. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ellen, for that. I open that up to the floor on item nine. Uh, Alderman McClintock, Hillary. Chair, just um, to propose the recommendation, I think Local Democracy Week is always a, a good opportunity for young people and members to engage. So happy to propose the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Alderman McClintock. Uh, Councillor Mooney, Sean. Happy to second that, Chair. Uh, on that basis, as Alderman McClintock has said, just that uh, this is a great um, initiative to get new members to get involved with the local community. So on that basis, happy to second. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Mooney. Uh, Alderman McCready, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. I support the recommendation as well, wholeheartedly. If only you know this was available, you know, when we were younger. Well, certainly, I speak for myself. Um, maybe things would be could be could be worse, could be better. Who knows? But it, it we should certainly be taking away the taboo, the the nastiness of of. of you know, politics and just present young people with the opportunity to to explore democracy, you know, that kind of freedom of speech to be different, to to speak up and speak out and, and have the confidence to do so. So I, I really am looking forward to, to this program of events and I'll be doing my best to attend as many as I can and to, to see the young people and to, to kind of just live it, try and relive that youth that, that I've kind of tried to hold on to. But uh, good work from the officer who brought this uh, to to this committee and good work. I look forward to to it. So thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Alderman McCready. So again, members, i uh, going to take that as unanimous. Not hearing any opposition to it uh, here this evening. Uh, so happy to move on to item ten, which is member development. Back to you, Alan. Yes, three chair. Um, we have in front of us today sort of a comprehensive report in terms of uh, member and development activities over the last year. Um, the report aims to provide members um, with an update on those activities as part of year two of the Learning and Development Programme. Seek your approval for an updated um, policy which reflects the new criteria for the Charter Plus and also that members note the um, effectiveness assessment that is included within the papers, the assessment of equality of access and also the date for the new Charter uh, Plus um, reassessment. And um, obviously, we would encourage member involvement in that process. The background is set out there in terms of section two, um, and obviously highlights the fact that um, the council is working towards its uh, development charter plus award. Um, key issues are arising uh, within the report identifies high levels of um, of the of our actual planned activities actually taking place. So that, um, ninety percent of the courses planned were actually delivered and 52% of that training was delivered in house, which obviously has economic benefits. Um, the policy, as I say, has been updated to, to implement a new framework uh, for the Charter Plus. And then in terms of member effectiveness, 84% of all courses indicated uh, satisfaction levels, which are either good or excellent. Um, in terms of the expenditure, the, the program itself, um, cost at uh, five and a half thousand pound roughly for the year um, and in terms of the assessment of the access arrangements we, we have identified a potential issue in terms of um, visual disability so we're um, looking for improvement activities going forward in that and also we're taking forward a review of our equality data uh, monitoring and development uh, as part of that as well. Um, so, in terms of the reaccreditation, as highlighted again, the reaccreditation re date is November twelfth, uh, um, and the recommendations uh, in front of members today is again to note the the activities that were completed for year two, 
to approve the updated member uh, development policy uh, and to note the assessment of effectiveness and the quality of access and also the accreditation um, and reassessment date. Thank you, members. Okay, thank you for that, Ellen. Again, open it up to the floor for comments. A couple of indicated speakers, Councillor Boyle and Councillor Duffy. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. And um, don't expect that it's a declaration of interest, but obviously I'm the, I'm the chair of the member development working group, which includes fellow elected members. And I just want to put in the record um, uh, my personal thanks to all of them for their input into this particular program, um, uh, which I, I know we all. Uh, value um, uh, that that element of learning uh, that comes into being a public representative is, is very important because, as we all know, we all come from all different walks of life and we've all different experiences. And there are things that perhaps I know that others don't know. There are things I don't know. That, so we're all on a, a the same learning curve, and I think I think it has worked um, over the years. And just a remark as well, obviously, that um, we are about to <clears throat> receive our charter plus reassessment. Um, uh, on the date mentioned, uh, the 12th of November, uh, and just to encourage as many members as possible to en engage themselves with that part of the process because uh, the assessors will be looking to speak to um, elected members and not simply just those who are on the elected member working group. Uh, and to put in record my thanks to Sharon Maxwell and Karen Henderson in particular, the two officers who, who, who uh, lead this um, uh, on our behalf and who engage with us uh, on behalf of uh, the, the the council, um, uh, I mean, I've certainly over the years um, uh, benefited greatly from it. Uh, I certainly believe so. Um, uh, and just to say that <clears throat> uh, th it's worth remarking as well that uh, we were the first council uh, in the north to receive the Charter Plus uh, for our member development programs. Uh, and something we're now obviously going to be the first to be reassessed in this particular manner, um, and that's no mean feat as well. So I think it's something that everybody contributed to, and just to thank everybody for their for their efforts in that. And again, just to reiterate, I encourage as many as possible to engage with the process uh, on the 12th of November if they can. Uh, as I'm given to understand it, Chair, uh, the assessors are hopeful of coming and being able to do that in a physical environment, obviously with all the various safety measures in place that we all have come to know so well at this point. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Boyle. Uh, Councillor Duffy and then Alderman Hussey. Sandra. Thank you, Chair. And um, just to concur but, uh, with what John has been saying there, in terms of the member development, it has been excellent. And I, I can only commend those who, that have been part of the group, but also in terms of the training that has been made available to members. I have certainly availed of some of it and have found it all very useful in terms of myself. I did take part in the accreditation the last time and hope they again this time um, because I think that there has been sterling work going on and we do we have come so far in terms of the accreditation and the work that we do around member development. I would like to acknowledge in terms of um, the work around the facial impairment and I have to say I, I do appreciate that and probably should declare my own interest in it. Um, but just one comment on it. I'm struggling um, at the minute in the chamber. Um, because I can't read the comments that are in the chat box. So I just thought that I, I, Chair, if you wouldn't mind if there is a proposal in the chat box, could it be read out? Because even with social distancing, it's difficult to speak to my colleagues to find out what the what's in the chat box. So, yeah, so <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, you're right, uh, Councillor Duffy, about the chat box, and it's been difficult to see for members who are in the chamber. Um, I, I appreciate that. and and. I, I know it's been noted here by officers. Um, Alderman Hussey, Derek. Thank you, Chair. Another member of the committee, but I, I do want to fully concur uh, with the remarks of the Chair, Councillor Boyle, of the uh, Members Development Working Group. Uh, and uh, add, to, you know, endorse fully um, his remarks with regard to Sharon and Karen. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic and they do chase us up on uh, assessments following the various courses that we undertake. And I am testimony to the fact that you can teach an old dog new tricks. So uh, like Councillor Boyle, I would encourage all to avail of the training that is available. Uh, it makes you better uh, as a councillor and therefore better able to represent uh, those who have put us here. Uh, and uh, trusting that 
as we enter the, the Charter Plus um, as re reassessment, shall we say, uh, that we will be successful. But with, uh, with the, uh, the officers who are leading it, I don't have the slightest doubt that we will be. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Alderman Hussey. Uh, so, we're going to take that as unanimous. I'm not, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Heaney, go ahead, Connor. Uh, I, I just want to make a point just for, for the members of the working group and, and the officers, just in terms of going forward. Um, the consideration is given even when the public health advice does allow classroom based uh, members training to take place, that uh, the option of, of online uh, be considered and, and continued in some shape or form. It, it may well suit some members better and encourage them to participate in the members' training. So I'll just um, look at that point, please. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Connor. And that'll be noted as well by officers. So uh, happy to pose by John Boyle, seconded, seconded by Sandra and everyone in agreement. Uh, so thank you, that's carried unanimously. Uh, next item is item 11. Thank you, Chair. Um... Yeah, we're just waiting for Richard to join us online. Richard, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, more importantly. Um, hi. Uh, um, the report today is on the renewal of the license of the grant, grant finder funding uh, information portal and also the open book community portal for external, external users um, for a period of uh, five years to um, October 2026. Um, the current license is due to expire on um, 31st of October um, this year. Um, as members will be aware, there's been significant pressures on community groups um, uh, to secure external funding, um, increasingly so due to the pandemic. Um, throughout the pandemic, the funding unit in partnership with community services have been providing um, um, facilitated training sessions um, for users of the portal, um, which sort of basically resulted in a fairly significant increase in the uptake and success in terms of funding applications. We also now have 51 key members of staff throughout the council who have had also received training on the portal to be able to further support external um, users as well as obviously for their own um, work themselves. Um, we also have now a monthly funding bulletin um, highlighting key funding opportunities. Um, and which is, should also be being sent out now to members as well. If members aren't receiving that, you could uh, please let them know and we'll get that corrected. Um, the, um, some highlights from the last three years, well, it's, um, it's to date, um, the survey of the, the users has highlighted that 2.4, um, just over 2.4 of funding has been secured by community groups using the Open the Community Portal um, in the council area. Um, throughout the, the current three year subscription, 1.8 million has been uh, secured, um, with um, nearly 700,000 secured in the last year, the last 12 months alone. Um, this equates to, um, for the last three years, a return on investment of um, £113 per £1 invested by council. Um, so that's a, a, a significant return on investment into the back into the council area um, I'd just like to note uh, members to note that obviously this information is only based on those users who have actually replied to the survey so it's only a fraction of users and therefore um, it's, uh, uh, it's only a fraction of the, the, the funding that we see is, has been secured in the air in the council area by um, groups and um, in terms of um, the renewal um, the, uh, in terms of um, implications, don't think there's any major implications um, with respect to quality rule needs and climate change and data protection. Um, in terms of the renewal, um, obviously it's been three years since we've uh, had to uh, renew the, the uh, contract. Um, the way we do it is a three-year agreement paid annually, um, so it's not one lump sum, it is it is paid annually. And on the basis of the um, uh, pricing structure presented, we're recommending that um, we take a five-year option, um, with, um, which is resulting in the lowest annual cost to council and uh, a minimum impact on rate budgets, um, with an increase of 790 per annum 
um, to be factored into the 2022-23 rate deposit um, moving forward. So therefore, it's recommended that we um, uh, approve the renewal of the corporate license um, up until um, October 2026 at a cost of 57500 Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, the audio just at your end is quite low, so uh, I'll open it up to the floor if there is any questions uh, when you're responding. If you can maybe try and increase the audio at your end, please. Um, Councillor Fleming, Paul. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to uh, Richard for the, the report and the work that has went on to it. And uh, I would certainly propose that we accept the, the report, given uh, the content in terms of just how valuable it has been both internally to the officer core across three directives, and then obviously in a wider context within the wider community and the, the community groups in particular. And I think the figures uh, speak for themselves in terms of the amount of money that has been uh, accrued to groups over the last uh, number of years. And uh, the survey, why there wasn't a big return on the survey, even the return it was there, again, uh, copper fastened the fact that it has been used and it has been uh, effective. So in terms of the, the recommendation, five-year extension, and certainly would prefer Thanks for that, Councillor Fleming. Happy to propose it. I see it's been also proposed by Councillor Doyle in the chat box. So, Emmett, I'll treat that as a seconder uh, if you're happy with that. Uh, and open it up to the rest of the floor, uh, Councillor Farrell. Rory. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Richard. I was actually going to second it, but you know, Emmett, Emmett can have that uh, pleasure. Uh, so, happy to support the recommendation. It's pretty clear that investing this money in the Grand Finder. Um, license uh, reaps benefits for the council and, and community groups uh, that operate within the council area. And I think it is prudent that we uh, opt for the five-year option, which represents best value for money, and it's the most cost-effective option. So happy to support the recommendation on, on behalf of the SLP. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Farrell. So again, this item is going to pass unanimously. I don't see anybody in the kitten who wish to challenge it. So thank you, Richard, for joining us online and presenting that today. Um, members, that moves us on to items that are open for information, which we usually treat as just that. Uh, so unless anybody wants to pick out any of the items from 12 to number 20, uh, we'll move on to the confidential business. So I'll give it a moment and seek any nominations then for to go into confidential business. Uh, I see Alderman Hussey has indicated he wants to speak on item 12. Go ahead, Derek. It's just a, a quick one with regard to the uh, climate change adaptation plan. Have have Council ever been provided with um, emission levels, for example, over this last five, five years, to find out how we're doing uh, and where we currently stand? If we're, if we're aiming for zero, it's, it's always good to know what your starting point is. Uh, and I presume that comes on two levels. It comes on the level of council itself. And then it also comes on the level of our district area uh, as to how we're doing. But are those figures available? I, I just see it in uh, 2.1 there. So I was wondering how, you know, how we're judging this uh, as we progress uh, towards the zero emissions. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Alderman Hussey. I'm going to defer to officers to see if they have those figures here now, and if not, I'm sure they'll be able to try and furnish them to you. Um, Chair, through you, um, uh, we've, we've probably strayed significantly beyond the um, content of the report there when we get into that, um, but nonetheless, it is a very important issue. Uh, I don't have the figures before me today. Um, Karen Phillips is on the call and has them. Yeah. Um, Chair, if you want me to co comment on that, and members, no, I actually don't have specific figures with me today. Uh, members, looking at um, 
basically emissions within, I suppose, the, the council themselves and what they emit and indeed in the wider area is um, work that we have been starting to undertake um, over the last couple of years um, through our um, regional energy strategy that members may be aware of and our, uh, our climate um, action as well. Um, and indeed, members, you will be aware uh, through last month's um, Environment and Regeneration Committee that we've recently commis commissioned a piece of work to basically um, ensure that we have the, those figures uh, moving forward. So, members, we will bring further updates through ENR as we um, as we move forward on that. But what I will do is I will ask. Um, I will ask members, I'll bring a report to committee, but I can ask our, our uh, climate manager uh, and energy manager to provide some information to members or signpost you to the relevant committee reports that have already been taken through committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Karen, for that. And also thanks to Alderman Hussey for raising it and then also commenting in the chat box that he's content with that approach. So uh, so thank you, folks. Um, not seeing any other indicated speakers. Uh, so can I have a proposal to go into confidential, please? Proposed, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Morris. And a number of hands have been up in the chamber here as well. So uh, we'll just wait for a few moments for Leslie Ann to put us into confidential. Thank you. <laughs> 